Hello, Hello everyone, everyone, and welcome, and welcome back, back to, to the fourth, fourth edition, edition of the Atlantic, Atlantic Black, Black Sea Security, Security Forum. Forum. I'm, very I'm very happy, very happy to, to be back, be back in, front in front of you, of you offline, offline and, online and online, with our, with amazing, our amazing lineup, lineup of, speakers of speakers for this, for important, this important panel. panel. Uh, this, uh, panel this panel will deal, will deal with, with a topic, a topic that's, that's very um, dear to, uh, to uh, the, the, the Aspen Institute, Institute in Romania, in Romania resilience. 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 And the title, and the title of, the of the panel is Democratic, democratic resilience, resilience and the New and the Social, social and, economic and Economic Contract. contract. Now, we've now we've been, been um, um, talking, talking and, and writing a lot, lot on this topic, on this topic over the past years in the context of overlapping crisis, in the context of new um, threats, um, threats, hybrid, hybrid threats, threats to our, to our democracies, democracies, and in a and context, context where our shared, shared values, values are more important, important than ever, ever to, build to build public, public trust, trust or, or regain, regain the public's trust, trust in our institutions. In our institutions. Uh, uh, we, we are, are looking, looking forward, forward to an engaging, engaging discussion with our, with our speakers that I'm going to introduce in a moment. moment. My, name My name is Clara Volintiru. I am the program director for the New Economy and Society program, and together with all our participants, here, here at the, uh, in Bucharest, Bucharest, at the Diplomatic the Club, Club, and, and online, online with, with all our, our um, um, live streaming live audiences. audiences. I, hope I hope this will this be, be an important and relevant, and relevant discussion, discussion for the times, times we live in. Live in. We've, We've uh, tried, uh, tried in our materials, materials to characterize resilience, resilience from different, from different angles. angles. Uh, in, the uh, in the description of this panel, panel we're, talking we're talking using Ivan Krastev's characterization, characterization of a dynamic, dynamic comprehensive, yet operational, yet operational resilience, resilience framework. framework. We're, we're talking, talking about, about a forward, forward resilience, resilience, one that one builds that towards future, future threats, threats rather than reacts, reacts to the current, current ones. ones. And, and of course, we're talking about resilience in our societies from multiple angles, whether it is digital, digital or, or security, security um, um, threats, threats uh, in, uh, the in the neighborhood. So, so I, think, I, think, I think we will we be, able be able to do justice to this, this wide-ranging topic, topic with our, our amazing, amazing speakers, speakers. And, and I'm going to introduce, introduce them one by one, one, by one briefly, briefly and then, and then give, give them, them the floor, the floor uh, uh, in, this in this order. order. So, so we have, we have Yasmin, Yasmin Green. Green here with here us with online. online. Hello, Hello Yasmin. Yasmin. She's the She's director, director of research and development, and development at Jigsaw Alphabet, Alphabet. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure she's, gonna she's gonna provide, provide some, some, some fantastic, fantastic insights. insights. I'm only I'm sorry you're not here with us. I've seen some of your TED, uh, TED, TED talks, talks and I'm and sure the, the, audience the audience would have been thrilled. thrilled. We have we here Jean-Christophe Bass, founder and CEO of Connectors for Peace, and he's on the executive board of Aspen Friends. And this panel is developed in partnership with the Aspen Institute, Aspen Institute friends. friends. Thank you so, Thank you much, so much, Mr. Bass, Bass for being for here, with, here us. with us. We also we have Janos Bertok, who is the deputy director, director at the organization, the organization. For economic, for economic cooperation, cooperation and, development, and development, OECD. OECD. Uh, thank, uh, you, thank you, Mr. Bartok. And, and last but not but least, we have Jakub Kalensky, Kalensky, a senior, a senior analyst, analyst at the European, European Center, Center of Excellence for Countering for Hybrid, hybrid threats, threats in Finland. In Finland. What a wide-ranging wide geographical, wide geographical coverage we have with our, our, our lineup, lineup of speakers today. today. Thank, thank you so much, so Mr. Kalensky, as well. So I'm going to turn to our lady, ladies first. I'm going to ask Mrs. Yasmin, Yasmin Green, Green about the global, about the global challenges, challenges that we're that facing we're today. today. Um, um, it's, it's always right, right about, about challenges, challenges and, threats and threats and how do we engage, engage with them. them. But, but we are seeing, seeing an increasing, an increasing uh, sense, sense of vulnerability, of vulnerability in, the in the face of the current of global, global challenges. challenges. And we're, and we're seeing, seeing technology emerging as a double-edged sword. So on one hand, we, we see it empowering solutions and people everywhere, like it should. And on the other hand, we see it used for malicious campaigns and, and other instruments of destabilizing our societies. So my question to you is, how do we make sense of it and how, how do we harness the potential of technology for good and building our shared resilience? Thank you so much, Clara, and thank you to the Atlantic Black Sea Security Forum, and I'm, I'm excited for this conversation with these esteemed co-panelists. Um, I thought for, for scene setting, I could maybe share a little bit of what I've seen from my experience working in the tech sector. So when I started working at Google, uh, it was that was the era of tech utopianism 16 years ago, where the, the notion of the internet and, and um, international security concerns having anything to do with each other was very, uh, felt, very felt very removed. That was not um, things, a thing that people were concerned about. Um, and when I, when I, um, 
when I think about just how much the pendulums shifted, I think about the first malicious influence campaigns that I was working on uh, in earlier in my career, and that they were the recruitment campaigns of violent extremist groups. And I remember 10 years ago talking to experts on terrorism about um, violent Islamist use of the internet, and they really were not concerned at all that the internet would have anything to do with why somebody would go to Afghanistan and join the Mujahideen. Um, and people that, who were working in the internet were also not concerned that online radicalization would be um, a meaningful uh, factor in violent extremist groups. And then five years later, by 2015, the pendulum had swung so far the other way that the, the rhetoric was, it's the fault of the internet that ISIS exists. Um, so we're, we've really experienced the internet becoming, you know, something that was very peripheral to a lot of security concerns to something that's very central um, uh, and urgent for us to address. So uh, another piece of scene setting that I wanted to share is some of the philosophies of the internet that were so crucial in giving us the, the, the online environment that we have now. One of those was um, the the free marketplace of ideas. So early on, the, the, the philosophy was more speech is the antidote to bad speech. Good speech will, will um, address bad speech, and so we, the more, the better. Uh, and the other um, attribute of the, the approach to the internet in the early days was that friction is evil, latency is bad. We want to get people to, to share an innocuous example, you know, search results in nanoseconds faster than they've had them before because speed is so crucial. So those philosophical underpinnings gave us an internet that gave people a voice around the world that they'd never had and gave people an audience, um, but that connection and community could be used not just for good, but, but also for ill. Um, and I, I think that the early um, naivety around the design of the internet has given us a system that is um, profoundly vulnerable to exploitation. <laughs> Um, uh, my group at uh, Google Jigsaw, we have a lot of technical teams that do very sophisticated work analyzing speech with, with algorithms. So looking for different types of toxics to help platforms figure out what to remove or you know, how to moderate. But the, the work that I'm, I'm actually most optimistic about is the work that we do with academics across uh, the world to understand why it is that people are susceptible to misinformation and influence, malicious influence campaigns online and what we can do about it. And I think this speaks to going forward and how we can build resilience. So there's um, uh, an example of some, some um, partnerships that have, have developed between governments, tech and academia um, in the space of something called pre-bunking that I wanted to share as a as a, um, a, a ray of light potentially for us moving forward. Um, so people will be maybe familiar with the term debunking. Debunking is about um, uh, trying to correct false beliefs. It happens after the fact. Fact checks are an example of debunking. Um, Pre-bunking is what it sounds like in in the sense of preceding the bunk. So you're getting ahead of misinformation and you are building resilience to it. So you think, well, how can you get ahead of a, how can you, how can you get to people before the, the false information does if you don't know what the false information is? Uh, and it works at the level of narratives um, as opposed to individual false claims. So how do we build civic resilience? We need people who we, we cannot protect with the best algorithms in the world. And I, and I know how powerful these algorithms are. We cannot protect people from encountering um, potentially harmful information. So we have to, to invest in their resilience. And um, this pre-bunking strategy, strategy has shown um, in academia, now we've done live tests, including on social media platforms, um, helps build people's resilience to, to uh, manipulation attempts. So pre-bunking is a metaphor that I find helpful is like um, when you go and get a vaccine and you get um, inoculation to, to a biological vaccine, the, the pre-bunking formula is something may go viral. You go and um, exposed to a micro dose of it, just like you might be exposed to a micro dose of a disease. And then there's an emphatic refutation, um, you're given a very compelling correction, and then you are uh, kind of um, equipped with attitudinal inoculation. 
Um, so we've we've run studies that look at everything from um, radicalizing uh, narratives around, for example, race and, and um, the hierarchy of races to vaccine related misinformation. Uh, but also, and I think this is really powerful for us to, to think about in terms of where governments and um, uh, and kind of transatlantic investments could happen, also around building resilience to scapegoating, to fear mongering, to cherry picking of facts, the things that we we know that if people were um, equipped to spot attempts to manipulate them, then foreign disinformation campaigns, domestic disinformation campaigns, they would all be far, far less effective. Um, and now we have the science. I, I think of it as this, the, the coming together of the computer scientists and the behavioral scientists um, to show what can happen when, um, when we take our understanding of the human mind and design online strategies with, with those in mind. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. I think this was a very um, um, encompassing, encompassing perspective, perspective on, the on the technological instruments, instruments that, we, that have we have in our in disposal, disposal in the transatlantic trans space. space. And I think, and I think these, these instruments, instruments can, can serve, serve different, types different types of, of actors, actor. whether, whether they are they public, public stakeholders, stakeholders, whether they are private stakeholders, stakeholders whether, whether they, they are large, large private, private stakeholders, stakeholders or every, uh, every uh, citizen, right? Everyone will engage with each other within these new forums of online, uh, online uh, and, uh, new, and technologies. new technologies. And, and I think I building, building on this on framework, this framework that, that Mrs. Green just provided, provided we, can, we, can, we can move back, move back to, the to the actors or move forward, forward to, the to the actors and how and they how will they change, change in this, in this new, new environment. environment. So, I so I will turn, turn first to Monsieur, Monsieur Christophe Bass. Bass. And, and ask him, him about, this about this new, new and emerging, emerging concept, concept um, within, within the, the academic, academic and policy making circles, circles where, where we are talking about, about the stakeholder capitalism and the way uh, the, uh, public the public and the private, and the private sector, sector and, and society, society should engage with each other in a meaningful, meaningful manner. manner. And, and we see we new see ways in which, in which uh, these, uh, these stakeholders can engage, can engage but, at but at the end of the, of the day, day, the basis, the basis of the social of the contract has to have, have certain objectives. objectives. How, can How can they, they be, be reconciled? reconciled? We've learned, We've learned for, for so many years, years that, that you know, profit, profit goes, goes against, against um, welfare, welfare or, or that, that our, our general security, security might come at costs, not necessarily advantages. So how can we reconcile these apparently competitive, competing objectives in a time of unprecedented Presidented crisis. Presidented crisis. So, so we absolutely, absolutely need, need to, to shoot, shoot at, at more, more threats, threats than, than one. one. Monsieur, Monsieur Bass. Bass. Thank, Thank you, you Clara, Clara, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm delighted to take part in this panel, uh, and also in my Ask and Friends uh, capacity to be a co organizer of this, uh, this session. And actually, this session is uh, addressing uh, fundamental or yet existential uh, issues such as indeed values, uh, but also what is a good society? Um, so how can prevail the model of democracy and pluralism and human rights and the commitment to multiculturalism, uh, multiculturalism and international cooperation that are indispensable to promote peace and development? I think, I think that, that nobody, nobody will question, question that as, um, the, the West um, has won, won the Cold War, war and that it's so scandalously, namely, that those, those values, values would prevail and spread all around, around the world, ignoring somehow, somehow the, the, the reality of history, the reality of culture, and the reality of, of civilization. I think, I think it is also fair to say that, that the West. West has lost, lost what at least uh, might, might be losing the next, next phase in the shaping of, of the, the new world order, uh, probably by ignorance of this reality and somehow by its denial, sometimes or often or always systematically turning down the expectation of the rising world to bring to the table its own perspective and its own views. I know, I know this is somewhat, somewhat provocative to say that, that but, but um, um, I, I think, think that, that uh, we have not, not been, been really open to sort of global conversation uh, in order to build a truly, truly multipolar world. Um, we in the, the West, West indeed have thought that 
we wouldn't and that we couldn't impose our model and make it its universal. Today, in a way, it's high noon, uh, and probably the last chance or the last opportunity to engage in a truly global conversation to define the terms of the balanced world order that works for all and to avoid a great, a great divide and the risk of getting back to a bipolar world that has been profoundly damaging in the last century. And I think the only way we can make the democracy and the world is prevail is certainly not by trying to impose it, but by demonstrating its effectiveness and its decisive contribution to well-being and human progress. It also, it also requires, requires a change in mindset by recognizing and acknowledging that, that we in the West don't have, have always the absolute truth and by being open to other worldviews and perspectives. Our commitment to democracy and knowledge is something what brings us together today, but we must also confront the reality that it is not shared in the growing parts of the world uh, who considered that as somewhat, somehow, somehow democracy has failed and led to polarization, populism, and fractured societies, inequality. And probably our challenge today is certainly to define the terms of a new social contract, a model of society that can be a model in all parts of the world. It is a tremendous task uh, that, that requires, requires the mobilization of all um, and the capacity to build inclusive society. And my word of last word would be to say that I'm confident uh, about the decisive role and contribution that the Aspen Institute can play in this respect through its numerous affiliates around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think I you've think made, you've my, made job my job a lot, lot easier, easier because, because you, brought you brought into, into the, the conversation, conversation this idea this of, of governance, governance effectiveness, effectiveness and the and way the public way institutions, institutions have to, have deliver, to deliver in order, in order to, to harness, harness the example, example of our democratic, our democratic governance, governance model. model. So I'm going so to I'm gonna turn, turn now to Mr. Janos Bertok, Bertok, Deputy Director at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and bring the governance layer to our conversation on democratic so, so, what, in, what your in your opinion, opinion are the are main, main challenges to public, public governance, governance in this, in this critical, critical juncture, juncture where, we're, where at? we're at? And what can be done to strengthen it in order to strengthen our trust in institutions, in public institutions? Thank you so much, Clara. And I really appreciate this invitation to join this uh, formidable panel. And this is a very timely discussion on democratic resilience, uh, particularly because uh, in the region, uh, uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine pointed, and this is really the recent, most recent illustration of how these multidimensional and global security threats, they are threatening our democracies. These are the daily threats what all democracies are facing. And also it showed and pointed to some of the structural weaknesses. And you made uh, in the previous uh, uh, interventions uh, very clear what type of uh, uh, challenges or democracies are facing. And these were not always new because many of them, they were tested by the COVID crisis and the global challenges uh, which are ongoing, such as the climate change. As a consequence, uh, this is not uh, surprising to see that the citizens' trust in democratic institutions is diminishing. Actually, next week, we are launching a, a survey, a trust survey, a survey on trust in government, trust in public institutions, and this illustrates a lack of people's confidence in their government, and particularly the ability of the governments to address the challenges of today and tomorrow. So restoring this trust is really crucial for countries to govern effectively, build democratic resilience, and ultimately forge this new social and economic contract. But how to achieve? We see how governments are increasingly expected to address a number of public governance challenges. So let me highlight and join the previous interventions, 
highlighting first, uh, uh, this is the particularly in the region as a, as a high threat, which is building resilience to foreign-led influence. And these are the activities for destabilizing democracies. Estimates suggest that in the past decade, Russia and China alone, they have spent over 300 million US dollars interfering in democratic processes in a number of countries, not only in the region, but across the globe. So such foreign interference may include conducting disinformation as uh, Yasmin, you highlighted, but also leveraging on many of the loopholes for example, in lobbying, political finance regulations, interfere in domestic decision-making. We also see efforts to undermine media freedom and co-opt reputable civic institutions. For the second, let me pick up again this uh, misinformation and disinformation and the resilience to misinformation and disinformation. The false or misleading information on COVID it demonstrated the damage that this information can cause to public health. And also I need to refer to the, the attack on the Capitol, the US Capitol last year, January. And not surprisingly, the various trust surveys like the Edelman Trust Barometer confirms that 76% of people worry about false information. Actually, they see fake news as a weapon this is used as a weapon. So the question is how can democratic governments address these challenges? And I like to uh, highlight that uh, reinforcing democracy is a high priority for the OECD member countries, actually uh, shared values and including democratic values of uh, representation, free election, but of course the social dimensions, uh, e uh, equality, these are core uh, shared values of the membership of the OECD. And this is the reason that last year we launched a reinforcing democracy initiative to actively support governments in adopting innovative tools to strengthen the resilience of democracies in a number of ways. First, using the convening power of the OECD, mobilizing the leaders, the policymakers to advance coordinated responses to these common challenges. These are global challenges. For instance, we will gather governments, international organizations, but also civil society representatives and the private sector. We are organizing a global forum in November to forge a common agenda on strengthening trust and reinforcing democracy. And this will be back to back with our ministerial meeting on reinforcing democracy. But secondly, we are providing evidence and we are supporting this dialogue with the latest evidence, supporting our members in implementing, coordinating policies and tools to strengthen the democratic resilience, including areas of lobbying, political financing, countering disinformation, misinformation, but also illicit trade and other forms of illegal activities. This work draws on the strengths of uh, many of the OECD standards and good practices including recommendations such as recommendation on transparency in lobbying or the public integrity or the framework on financing democracy. Third, we also promote exchange. And I really appreciate uh, uh, your point, uh, Yasmin, because uh, uh, this is a shared responsibility and sharing emerging good practices. For example, the OECD, we are also setting up an OECD Dismiss Resource Hub in order to provide a space for governments. And these are the entities in charge of uh, fighting the disinformation or pre-bunking and debunking the misinformation and disinformation in order to share and learn about the institutional and the policy solutions to fight mis and disinformation and strengthen the information ecosystem. Naturally, we have been working with the uh, the other international initiatives uh, with the G7, the NATO, and the EU. And we are really looking forward to continuing with the private sector in order to secure synergies. Thank you so much. Thank you. And indeed, I think it is an important conversation to have on what can be done to strengthen our collective resilience. And indeed, there are shared uh, opportunities and shared instruments across the transatlantic space. 
And we've talked about um, malicious uh, information campaigns and the common threats to our democratic, democratic values. values. But at the but end at of the, the day, end of the day, we are we facing, facing more, more and more, and more social, social polarization, polarization within, within our, our society. society. So, so while we while have... We have a sort, a sort of, of consensus, consensus in the transatlantic trans space, space in the, in the current, current context, context of crisis. crisis. I, think I think we are still, we are still facing problematic, problematic threatening, threatening divides divide within, within our societies, our societies not, necessarily not necessarily across them. Across them. So, coming so coming back, back to, this to this perspective of the cleavages within, within our societies, societies and, and the way, the way hybrid, hybrid threats, threats are aimed at, at amplifying, amplifying them and destabilizing them from within, from within. I, turn I turn to, to the, the senior, senior analyst, analyst from, from the, the Helsinki, Helsinki Center, Center for Hybrid, hybrid Threats, threats. Um, um, Mr. Jakub Kalensky. And I'm going to ask you, as an expert on hybrid threats, what can be done to strengthen our, our societies while accepting this plurality in our democracies? Thank you very much for the question and thank you once more for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure. I'm just sorry I can't be there uh, with you uh, in person. Uh, Firstly, let me just admit that I, I do not consider myself an expert on all the hybrid threats. So, for example, if you would like to talk about instrumentalized uh, migration, you would probably have uh, some better speakers. But I focus mainly on, on disinformation, which is obviously quite a big part of uh, this panel. And uh, especially on countermeasures uh, against disinformation, I've been collecting them for the past uh, uh, few years. Um, and I developed this, um, I call it four lines of defense approach that there are kind of four bigger groups of, of countermeasures that we need to be uh, taking in order to mitigate the threat. And I think it, in all of them, be it the governments or the media or the civil society or the private business, in all of them, we can significantly step up uh, what we are doing uh, currently. The, the first line of, of defense would be documenting of the threat. And I know it sounds extremely primitive, but unfortunately, we still have many questions uh, to which we don't have, don't have uh, any answers, like how many disinformation uh, channels there are, how many messages per day they spread, how many people do they persuade. Uh, there's been an opinion poll a few years ago in, in Ukraine where they obviously know about uh, the threat of Russian disinformation the most. Um, uh, one of the questions was, do you trust Russian media? And you would have 99% of respondents saying, no, we don't. Uh, but then uh, the organization started asking them about the singular messages that the uh, Russian disinformation-oriented media spread. And suddenly you would already have 20, 30, 40% uh, actually believing Russian disinformation stories. So sometimes the impact is significantly bigger than, than you would uh, estimate from, from the first question, uh, whether you read or whether you trust uh, the Russian media per se. Uh, and I'm afraid that, that we still don't know a lot about how big the impact of uh, disinformation, and more specifically, maybe the Russian disinformation is. Um, for example, in, in Slovakia, 30% of people believe that uh, it's the West that is to blame for the war in Ukraine, uh, not actually the country that amassed uh, dozens of thousands of troops around Ukraine and invaded the country. Uh, but we would need these numbers for, for all the European countries, and we would need to see whether they decrease or increase uh, because if we don't know uh, what this number is, then we don't even know how successful our countermeasures are. We are kind of fighting, fighting in a fog. Uh, imagine fighting uh, the, the COVID pandemic without having the information how many people were infected, how many people died. And unfortunately, we are in this situation with, uh, with uh, disinformation still. The, the second line of defense would be raising awareness about the threat. So whereas in the first line, we are trying to get more information, uh, in the second line, we are trying to spread it uh, among more people. I, I think actually this line might be most similar to, to what Yasmin was describing as this pre-banking. And there was a brilliant success story in, in Lithuania uh, where uh, their effective pre-banking or raising awareness about how Russian disinformation works helped them to kill a disinformation before it even had time to spread. Uh, this was when uh, when the German battalion for the enhanced forward present exercise came came to Lithuania, and uh, the Lithuanian Armed Forces Stratcom warned uh, authorities, uh, media, politicians, uh, institutions that there will be disinformation campaigns targeting targeting this NATO NATO exercise. 
uh, Russians came up with a story that a little girl was allegedly raped, very similar to the story a year before in, in Germany, the, so the famous uh, Lisa case. Uh, but the Lithuanian Lisa case uh, fell completely flat because uh, the mayor of a small town somewhere in Lithuania where they first uh, registered the story, he immediately alerted the Stratcom team, they immediately debunked the story, uh, alerted all the newsrooms, all the institutions. And the first story in the media was not a little girl allegedly raped by, by foreign soldiers, but the first story in the media was another information attack by, by Russia. And you don't have to solve the problem that people already believe a false story and you don't need to be playing this, this catching up, which is almost impossible to, 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 to win. Uh, so, so this raising of awareness is, is really crucial. And here, probably the key message is that we need bigger numbers. Uh, unfortunately, the people on this, on this panel, they will not reach 100% of the audience. The media, they will not reach 100% of the audience. And we need many different speakers for many different audiences. We need initiatives like, uh, again, I will mention Lithuania. There, there is a journalist called Andriu Stapinas. He has this show uh, called Hang In There. Uh, he's weekly mocking Russian propaganda in a format similar to John Oliver. He's reaching people that governments will not reach. Uh, mainstream media will not reach, but he's still educating them about the threat of Russian disinformation. Humor helps tremendously to, to raise uh, awareness among audiences that wouldn't care about this problem. The third line would be repairing of the weaknesses. Uh, the information aggressors are always trying to find weaknesses in our uh, societies and they will be finding different weaknesses in different societies so whereas in the us it might be the racial question around which you can polarize the society the most it's it's the racial question is not such a topic in my country czech republic which is uh, racially homogenous and for some reason although we don't have any migrants the migration crisis is one of the most polarizing polarizing topics here the most of the energy is spent on on social media and frankly, I actually think that they they done a lot of work in the past uh, five or six years, uh, maybe even more than, than some other segments of the information space. I think there are still some weaknesses in the traditional media. And we also need to address the weaknesses in the socio-economic uh, sphere. And this is already not a thing for for communication professionals. This is more a policy question. But we need to be overcoming the differences between the capital and the and the countryside between uh, the younger and the older generation between people with higher income and lower income these are the dividing lines that the disinformation aggressors are trying to target so we need to be working on on repairing uh, the weaknesses and finally the fourth line uh, would be trying to limit or deter or punish the information aggressors and i think here here we really did actually probably the least uh, I think there is still so much more that could be done. Naming and shaming of, of the disinformers, but also sanctions, and not just against the individuals. Since February, we stepped up with the sanctions against against uh, Russian pseudo-journalists, but also, also sanctions uh, against the organizations. Um, in 2021, some of the biggest advertisers on Russian state TV uh, were still Western companies. They were effectively paying for anti-Western propaganda. Without their money, Putin probably wouldn't have the money uh, to pay for, for various language version, web versions of, of Russia Today and Sputnik. Um, so sanctioning these organizations, that, that would be a huge step. Um, perhaps uh, let, me, let me stop with uh, investigations. There, there were dozens of elections and referenda targeted by uh, Russian information operations. I am aware of one country only where they properly investigated it, and that was the US. So although we had at least 20 elections and referenda targeted by, by Russian disinformation operations since uh, 2013, I'm actually not aware of a single investigation anywhere in Europe that would be resembling the, the Mueller investigation. And that is a very bad message uh, for the, for the, uh, that we can send outside. That, that's the message that we do not really care whether you conduct these uh, disinformation operations. We will not even investigate it. The investigation being the first step in order to be able to actually punish the perpetrators. So I think I think in all of the four lines, we could actually step up uh, our game and be doing much more. But let me stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So many great points. And I think this idea of differentiating between 
uh, our societal vulnerabilities and the way malicious campaigns are exploiting them is important and that's why this panel tried to cover both, both. not just not the just tactics, tactics and the and threats, threats but also, but also our within weaknesses, weaknesses that, can that can be targeted. Be targeted. And, I and I remember we, we just, just uh, last, uh, last year, year finished a report, report at the Institute, Romania, Institute of Romania where we where differentiated between, between the input, input information, information for, for fake news and disinformation, the process, which is what debunking and pre-bunking education, how you, how you train, train people, people to have a cognitive, cognitive awareness, awareness towards and resilience, and resilience towards, towards such campaigns, such campaigns. And, and the further the dissemination peer-to-peer, -peer, peer -peer, the out process, the process of disinformation, because, because often you, you, you get, get it spread, spread across, across our societies, our societies without, without necessarily having, having um, um, the, the, the vector, vector of a malicious, of a malicious uh, informer, uh, informer, but, but spreading, spreading like, a like a virus, virus in a sense. And so I think we are having these overlapping layers of vulnerability that we need to address. And because, and we're, because coming we're coming to, to the end, end um, uh, of this of panel, this amazing, amazing panel, panel that, that I don't want, I don't to, want to, to finish, finish. Very, soon, very soon, I'm going to ask you the key question. question. So, so, all of you, all, all, all four of you, of you. If, we if we want to maintain, to maintain our democratic, our democratic values, values and, and our, 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 our uh, shared, shared resilience, we need to enforce a new contract, right? right? This is what the panel is about, a new social and economic contract. What is, in your opinion, the key ingredient for such a contract? One that, that would that safeguard, safeguard our, our democratic, democratic values. values. You have the you floor. Have the floor. Yes, yes me. Let's, Let's start in the start same, in the order. same order. Uh, uh, I, I mean, mean uh, so looking, looking at this through the lens of uh, resilience, resilience to manipulation of misinformation, I think it gets it, pluralism um, and um, Resilience, resilience against, against dehumanization, dehumanization uh, which, which is, is what uh, there are very, very seductive on-ramps on to the types of dehumanization that allow people to support another country being invaded or allow for anti-migrant um, hate and violence. Uh, and so um, seeing the humanity and value that in one another seems in to me. Monsieur Ba? Uh, I think I, think I will... will uh, Repeat, repeat what, what I said, I said before, before or, or, and, and expand a bit, you know, know that, that, uh, it's very important to, to change our mindset and, and to understand or to be more open-minded and to understand that, that we don't have always the absolute truths. Uh, in a way, we have been raised, educated, and formatted to consider that, that uh, our model of society, our Western world is the perfect model. Maybe it is. Uh, but, but I think, I think it, is it is absolutely vital to agree to, to acknowledge and understand that some, a growing part, part of the world is thinking differently. differently. And, if and if we want, want to win the battle, battle uh, or, or to have our values prevail, prevail, we need we also to listen, listen and to look at other perspectives, perspective, to respect them, them and, and in a way to demonstrate that the model that we propose is a more effective model that works for all and for human progress and accomplishment. Otherwise, you know, we will remain in this sort of denial and that in a way will lead to a confrontation instead of a conversation. Hmm. So, so, building on the conversation, Mr. Bartok. What's your What's input? Your input? Uh, from a uh, historical uh, perspective, perspective, as you know, the OECD was, was uh, started in the Second World War as a uh, uh, rebuild in Europe. So this is a testament for international collaboration. And uh, from this uh, public governance public perspective, uh, I would really highlight uh, that uh, public governance and, and government, government leaders they need to really raise their, their global responsibilities and mobilize all, all the government tools. tools. So, this so this is not only the strategic division of leadership, particularly from the center of government, but also how to drive progress, how to uh, not only coordinate across levels of government or horizontally, but how to mainstream all these high-level priorities in the, the governance tools. tools. Governance tools start with, with budgeting, budgeting regulation, regulation, or public government, and how to use all, all these government tools in order to achieve, achieve these global objectives. Mr. Kalinsky. Mr. Kalinsky. Uh, yes, yes, I, I think, think it's, it's 
Uh, I, would I would probably, probably think, think that, that the, the key, key ingredient is uh, determination. Uh, I'm, I'm not afraid, afraid that, that the uh, malicious, malicious actors, actors like the Russians, Russians like the Chinese, Chinese are still more determined, determined to harm us than we are determined, determined to defend ourselves. ourselves. Uh, that, that results in the fact, fact that they still put, put significantly more numbers into, into their uh, malicious, malicious activities. activities. And, and, and this, this is not just my conclusion, I know I read it in Richard Stengel's book on information wars. Just a few days ago, Ed was publishing a report uh, also, also on the information space, space in Europe. Europe. The, the Russians are still putting significantly more numbers to this. Numbers to this. They, are they are beating us there. there. It's, it's not, not the sophistication of their message. message. It's not the uh, sophistication of their methods. methods. It's, it's just a number. number. Quantity has a quality of its own, own as, as, as Stalin said. Uh, uh, so I think, I think until, until we step up our game, game until we have uh, more numbers, numbers uh, on our side, side I'm, I'm afraid, afraid that we might be still losing the game. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. I hope, I hope we've, <laughs> we've added, added some, some critical, critical thoughts, thoughts and, engaged and engaged some critical, some critical, masses, critical masses to the numbers, to the numbers of, of <laughs> strengthening our society, our society. Uh, uh, with, with greater, greater awareness, awareness and uh, greater determination. determination. Thank, you. Thank you. And greater, and greater effectiveness, effectiveness, right? right? Some, some of the key ingredients, ingredients that, that this amazing, amazing lineup, lineup of speakers, speakers has highlighted. Has highlighted. Thank, Thank you so much to all of you. And I do hope you will join us in person at the future event at the Aspen Institute in Romania. Romania. Thank, you, Thank all you all so much. So much. And, to and to our audiences, audiences online, online and offline, and offline many, many of you here in the room with us, with us. we're going to take, take a five minute five break, break and then, and then rejoin, rejoin with, with, oh, oh sorry, sorry, three minute, three minute break, break because, because everyone is in the room already. already. And then we're going to rejoin you with a very interesting panel. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Thanks uh, for still being with us uh, at uh, this uh, rather uh, uh, important topic on cybersecurity. And I'm very happy that I uh, am honored to host this, uh, this panel. Um, just as a brief introduction, I remember um, not so many years ago, uh, cybersecurity was more like a uh, uh, faraway fight, you know, uh, a guy with a hoodie on a uh, basement, uh, alone uh, in front of a, of a desktop. Well, they change a lot, uh, uh, I believe. And um, uh, we saw um, already before the invasion of uh, Ukraine that constant cyber attacks uh, and often carried by the uh, on behalf of state uh, actors and uh, di directing and um, damaging uh, infrastructures, information systems in liberal dem uh, democracies had led to a, to a change, a paradigm shift uh, in the security and defense uh, field. Uh, and NATO allies uh, uh, have endorsed the cyber defense pledge uh, uh, and are first uh, further boosting their national uh, cyber defense based on the commitments made uh, uh, then. Uh, well, nowadays, uh, I believe it became more clear that the cyberspace is not something in a basement uh, uh, somewhere in uh, the middle of nowhere, but is uh, the front line of, uh, of war. So, um, um, but on the other hand, uh, when it comes to the war, you know there are uh, fields, territories, where the army is, uh, where, what do you defend. On the cyberspace, it's a different, different story. So we would like to talk about this, uh, this, uh, this space, but also um, to, uh, to see how the uh, different uh, society actors relate to this, uh, to this new reality. Uh, and how they can better collaborate in this uh, fight, how the cyber and digital space is seen from this, this different perspective, but how can we combine all of these efforts in a more resilient, uh, and not only uh, cyberspace, but uh, society and uh, democracy. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, with us today uh, Ms. Anne Neuberger uh, from uh, Washington, I believe. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Ms. Anne Neuberger. I also check the, the, the sound if, uh, if it's okay right now to. Good afternoon to you all. It's a pleasure to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, it was a constant fear, uh, you know, nowadays that uh, the technical things uh, drop us uh, somehow. Uh, also, uh, we have today Mr. Dragos Tudorake, uh, member of European Parliament and vice president of the uh, Renew Europe Group and Chair of the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence uh, in the Digital Age. Uh, hello, Mr. Tudorake, welcome. Good afternoon, many thanks for, for the invite. And uh, together with me, uh, uh, I have uh, Mr. Duncan Pan, uh, Director of the Romanian National Cyber Security Directorate, with a huge experience in cyber security, I may say. And uh, also, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ivașcu, um, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Modex, uh, welcome. And uh, I believe also um, online, but we'll try to make a connection uh, later on. Apparently, we doesn't work with uh, one of our guests as well. So um, I will I will go to uh, I will start directly because we have a, a very limited time and uh, we have to uh, take care of this agenda. The organizer are pushing me already. Uh, so uh, I will go uh, straight to uh, Ms. Anna Neuberger, Deputy Assistant uh, to the President, President of, and Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technologies, White House's National Security Council. Um, and um, I will go straight to, to what I mentioned in the opening, uh, the cyber defense pledge that NATO allies endorsed back in 2016. And, uh, uh, you have an absolutely impressive experience in this field, and I would like to ask you uh, to set the ground, but zooming in from that moment to uh, what is happening today, uh, but also from lessons learned uh, in cyber defense uh, in uh, not only in the U.S. and the position you, you, you have right now, but also uh, from the early days in, uh, of war in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, 
Was it a, a key moment, or uh, did it change that strategic uh, thinking related with cybersecurity that moment, or it was already on the agenda? First, thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate the invitation of the of Aspen and the German Marshall Fund, and of course my good friend Marcia Joanna. He's really the reason I'm here today. He talked so much about how important this forum is for me. So it's very good to be here with all of you. To your question, you know, cybersecurity has been a priority for this administration since really the beginning. Um, President Biden made clear that investments in domestic resilience was physical and cyber resilience are a key priority. And certainly, Russia's war in Ukraine has only sharpened our focus on this issue as we look at addressing an array of cyber-related um, risks. And in addressing one of the key tenets we've been really focused on has been partnerships. Because at the end of the day in cyber, there are no boundaries. It's one global communications environment. Grants move very quickly. Approaches that we try that reduce risks can be very um, successful in other countries as well. So we can not only learn from our partners and allies, we can of course help build capacity and teach. So in our focus on partnerships, there have really been four key components. And the first key component is make radical and significant cybersecurity improvements in our country's critical infrastructure, in the power systems, the water systems, the electricity systems, oil and gas pipelines that our citizens rely on, and work very closely with international partners to share standards and to really share approaches in securing both information technology and operational systems in that. So that's the first core line of effort that we've been focused on and that Russia's um, unprovoked invasion in Ukraine really led us to deepen the focus on. Second is helping partners to recover from significant incidents. And the core takeaway, which I've learned from experience managing many both national and, and other significant incidents, is the more one prepares in advance and the more one exercises, the more prepared we are. And I'll speak to that in the context of the, the NATO virtual cyber defense capability in a moment. The third, of course, is reinforcing international norms. We have a set of voluntary international norms that most countries have signed up for at the UN, including such norms like not disrupting critical infrastructure in countries. However, those are voluntary, and we really are shifting to being focused on implementing those norms in partnership with other countries. And that's the reason you've seen us do things like publicly attribute hacks. For example, um, Russia's hack of satellite systems across Europe. We did that arm in arm with the European Union and other partners because we feel that as a community of nations, when we call out irresponsible state behavior in cyberspace, that is a key part of implementing those international norms. And then finally, as a second component of that, then holding state and non-state actors responsible for any disruptive or destructive cyber activity. So I'll close with talking about the NATO virtual cyber defense capability. And really, as I noted, my friend and close colleague, Mircea Joanna, has been a key partner on this, and I want to publicly thank him for his leadership. At NATO, we talked about NATO's role from a physical perspective in terms of defending allies from major incidents defending allies in context of a physical invasion. As we look at the virtual component of that, we are working to build a virtual cyber capability to respond to any significant attack against an ally and a request for an ally of support. So all, country, all members of NATO have committed um, to participate in this. I traveled to Brussels three times in October and March and in May for NATO for NAC meetings to essentially accelerate putting cyber on the agenda, and more importantly, accelerate actual progress in on-the-ground capabilities and in building the connectivity and partnership to bring different countries' capabilities, insights, and knowledge together to respond to a significant cyber incident against an ally. So that leaves a really good foundation now for us to build on um, and towards an upcoming NATO pledge conference in early. Thank you again, and I look forward to hearing both my colleagues' comments on this panel and to the discussion, Raju, that you will so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I echo totally uh, on the idea of collaboration, but not collaboration to 
defend the space, but more defending our values and, uh, and uh, what they mean for, for us. Uh, I'll move now from uh, east to, uh, to, to, from west to east, uh, to European level, uh, to Mr. Dragos Todorake. Um, a very dear person to me and a, my former boss, so uh, uh, I, <laughs> I have to say that. Um, uh, Mr. Trulake, uh, one of the big uh, challenges uh, I see related with the new technologies uh, is the need to ensure that um, while using these uh, technologies, we understand also the risk for uh, the economy and uh, the society and, as I said, uh, our democracy after all. Uh, you are chairing the special committee on uh, artificial intelligence. Um, how does it look from the European level, this uh, challenge? Uh, can we regulate uh, uh, but, uh, to mitigate these risks, but also keep the innovation and the competitivity uh, alive? Well, I think we do. But uh, first and foremost, again, many thanks for, for the invitation, uh, Radu. And You'll always be my colleague, certainly. <laughs> I've never been your boss, uh, but I close know. that bracket. Um, I'll, I'll actually, for two, three minutes, zoom out a bit even further from, from your question, uh, Radu, and, and address the issue, because that's really an issue that, that I think is fundamental to how we at the European level have been uh, addressing um, the issue of, of digital transformation and the whole landscape of norms, legislation that we've been preparing and that we're still working on uh, for the years to come. Um, and that is also something that is very relevant to, I think, today's overall theme, which is security and, and defense. And that is, uh, I think, the specific uh, interaction between the data-driven uh, technological transformation revolution uh, these days and defense, which is a bit unique uh, if we look in history to previous uh, technological uh, revolutions. It's unique because, in fact, technological advancement in history used to be very closely linked to warfare. Um, to a large extent, whether directly or indirectly, but most technology emerged out of actual wartime needs, or they were influenced, they were motivated, they were driven by either defense or offensive interests, but again, linked to security. And that is something that is very different today uh, because the data-driven economy and the data-driven tech transformation that we all are witnessing is something that has no longer been prompted by defense needs. It actually grew in the private sector almost entirely. Most of the innovation has been done in the private sector. Most of the expertise in the, is in the private sector, and also most of the tools, in fact, the tools of the trade, uh, of the data-driven economy, uh, are in the hands of the private sector. And that is true for software, for algorithms, for application. It's true for hardware as well. Most of the most powerful computers of the world are in uh, the private sector, in the private hands, let's say. And also most of the infrastructure whether uh, solid ground-based infrastructure or mobile 5G or satellites, they are also, again, in private hands. Imagine the war in Ukraine, since uh, this was something that was discussed quite a lot today. Imagine the war in Ukraine today without Elon Musk's starting access in the early days of the war. Or imagine the war in Ukraine without access to applications that are allowing the actual targeting and um, establishing the location of forces um, on the battlefield or the location of commanders. You know, this is the war with the highest number of confirmed uh, kills on the battlefield of commanders. And that is a lot due to technology. But again, a lot of this technology comes from the private sector. And I'm saying this because I think it has several implications. And the first one is the fact that whoever writes the rules for the digital transformation uh, is going to have uh, an upper hand um, in geopolitical terms. Um, we are right now very much witnessing the, uh, the growth of, let's say, technology and the technological conversation for bringing uh, uh, something that is 
left for experts and techies to something that is dominating the geopolitical agenda. And that is because, again, uh, these uh, means, uh, the technological means, are so fundamentally important now for everything we do, not only in our societies and economies, but now also in our defense. And uh, again, whoever will be writing the norms and the standards uh, is going to uh, be uh, having the upper hand also geopolitically. So this is where we have an interest to cooperate among like-minded like partners. This is what's happening under the TTC uh, with our transatlantic partners in the US, but not only in other multilateral fora we're working with Japan, with South Korea, with Canada, with all those that understand, again, uh, the values uh, that underpin what we do in the same way, they understand democracy in the same way, and therefore also the way we look at the rules that need to rule the digital, uh, we uh, understand them in the same way. Therefore, we also have an interest to write the standards in a way that, again, fits this understanding of values. The second implication is that it requires a level of cooperation between the private sector and the public sector um, of a different magnitude than what we've done so far. Uh, the US has a more natural uh, reflex of uh, actually uh, encouraging cooperation between the private and the, and the public sector, particularly in the area of defense. Uh, but this is something that is not that natural uh, over here on the EU side, and this is something that over the last two, three years, it's been a constant uh, preoccupation uh, of the decision makers, uh, rule regulators here in the EU, to encourage, to create the ecosystems where the private and the public come together to serve uh, public interests. And uh, one of that interests clearly now is defense, even more so motivated now by what has been happening in Ukraine. And third is investment. We are seeing already, but we are going to see a much uh, more uh, focused public investment uh, in uh, this technology, motivated by the need to bring them closer, closer to our also defense interests. And certainly, there will need to be dedicated uh, defense uh, data uh, ecosystem, uh, data spaces, like we, the EU, is creating and proposing uh, data spaces for other sectors of the economy. Why? Because we will need to encourage innovation, innovation, innovation that is also interoperable in the area of defense. And maybe last one word on, on where we are and how we strike that balance that you mentioned rather earlier. Um, as we write the norms, as I was saying earlier, that it is imperative that we uh, write norms, we write rules, we write standards uh, for technology. Uh, this has been the, the main logic and the main approach uh, at the EU level, finding that balance between um, addressing the genuine legitimate concerns we have with the growth of the role of technologies in our lives, but at the same time without uh, stopping their positive effects uh, on our uh, economies and societies, encouraging uptake and, and innovation because there is also a a clear realization at the level of, of, of political elites in Europe that we absolutely need uh, to continue innovating and not create uh, barriers uh, for growth um, by the way we impose norms. And I think this balance between the two interests is something that we need to be very, uh, very careful with. And as a rapporteur also of the AI Act in the European Parliament, uh, this is a balance that I will try to, to strike uh, in the coming year and a half of negotiations that we have uh, ahead of us. And maybe one last sentence, sorry to be so long, on, on cybersecurity, because it is one of the topics of, of this conversation. Uh, there's also been an awakening uh, at EU level as to the need to address cybersecurity much more structurally, more profoundly, uh, not only with, with an agency thrown somewhere uh, in, in Europe, but actually with uh, a complete revision of the normative environment, also with uh, investment, with more cooperation, and with the mutualization of efforts uh, between member states. Uh, and now, even more so, more importantly, as Mrs. Nürberger was saying as well, uh, a mutualization of efforts between the EU and NATO as well. So I'll stop here, Adu. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And um, one of the key things I, I, I took is indeed the tools are in the uh, ownership most, uh, in most of the cases of the private sector. So collaboration is the key, uh, dialogue is the key in order to, to make a more resilient uh, space. Uh, and I'll move to Mr. Duncan Pan. Uh, um, 
you've been in the middle of the fight, uh, to, to, be, to be very honest, and uh, we had some conversation uh, uh, weeks ago about uh, real examples of the fight, not uh, theoretical ones. Uh, and um, uh, I was uh, curious, um, the cyber fight was there for, for some time. Did it change uh, due to the to the war in Ukraine? Is it a different uh, story now, or it's a different level? Or uh, how uh, um, it's easier to know where the enemy is right now? So um, thank you so much for the question. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. Um, cyber, it's a buzzword since many years, as you all know. Um, and uh, as you say at the beginning, probably at the beginning we were all wearing hoods and stuff. <laughs> now we are wearing suits and uniforms and uh, hoods as well, uh, as uh, cyber geeks. Uh, but the matter of the fact is, it's more and more on the top of the agenda of almost every decision maker, every board, every politician, every government, and so on. So it's something that absolutely we cannot ignore at this stage. What we noted, um, although cyber operations, cyber attacks against Romania, against our allies, against our critical infrastructures happened in the past years as well. What I note, and I speak from the perspective of the organization I'm leading, uh, what we note recently, especially since the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, we noted a slightly different change in the complexity and sophistication of those attacks. Uh, just facts, um, Romanian authorities, uh, together with our international partners, uh, so far we detected, isolated, uh, basically contained, neutralized thousands of IT assets, more precisely 27447 and counting. Um, I know the figure by heart. Um, that were actively used in a variety of ways by um, groups, will not enter into details, in executing cyber attacks. Uh, what is very strange and very different is that these were cyber attacks against governmental infrastructures, media organizations, football clubs, political parties, biz legitimate businesses, and so on. So, a bit indiscriminatory, and this is the footprint of this type of operations that we see. Um, they are all attacks, and personally, I see them really attacks against our democracy and freedom, as simple as that. Now, how you defend in cyberspace without borders against attacks that are using proxies, are using uh, foreign flags and stuff like that, um, with a variety of cheap tools, so attacks easy to mount, easy to launch, cheaper to launch, where as a country um, you have to follow rules and uh, where you have to also coordinate with your allies and partners and uh, like-minded uh, partners and countries. Um, obviously, and it was already said, plenty of capabilities to help us defending and uh, being more resilient and uh, more prepared are in private hands. So we absolutely have to go in the direction of having a mega strong partnership between public and private capabilities, not forgetting the academic environment, so the education system. Because, um, and I say this a couple of times to my bosses as well <laughs> this week and in other uh, um, events, we need not only budgets, we need brains at this moment. I'm more worried about not having the people, the experts, to help us uh, staying uh, resilient and containing the incidents. Then I'm worried about having the servers and the licenses and the tools. Uh, now, this is a common challenge for all of us and the probably whatever we are doing now, today, um, cross-Atlantic, uh, we may need to do five times more in terms of cooperation, information exchange, alignment, building common capabilities and capacity ready to deploy wherever is needed uh, between us and our allies. Uh, I may sound a bit pessimistic, 
five times more, probably I'm optimistic, we may need 10 times, 20 times more. Uh, and that's a serious challenge, my friends, uh, because um, I'm one of the guys from the old generation. The real people that will have to handle the issue are the ones that are now in high school and university. So they are the group in which we have to absolutely invest, 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 make sure that they stay focused and we put them at good use on a super large scale. Uh, I was reading a couple of days ago uh, that um, at the level of uh, European Union, the deficit of cyber experts may be somewhere in the range of 700,000. I was like, wow, uh, I thought that my own estimation at the Romanian level that we are missing 2,500 is a big deal. Apparently, we are pretty good uh, compared with other countries. So we have really major challenges. Uh, we are facing a completely new dynamic, and we saw it since the invasion of Ukraine. Um, things evolve very fast, and um, I think it's just a matter of time when almost uh, up to the moment when almost each European Union member state may face major attacks, major incidents. We already saw this. Um, we saw it recently in the US with the colonial pipeline, uh, the ransomware attack done by a dark side uh, Eastern European group. We saw it in Romania with um, Rob Petrol a ransomware incident. And uh, especially in these very, very complicated geopolitical times, we have to expect that the number and the frequency of this kind of incidents will, will increase. Let's not hide the elephant. Uh, we don't have to be naive. Huh? Um, this will happen. Of course, what will matter at that time, our capability and capacity to be resilient, to be up and running again in terms of uh, infrastructures, and to have the right knowledge, so the right brains, ready, steady, well-trained, going through multiple exercises and uh, well, well, well coordinated with our allies and partners. And uh, to wrap up a bit on this, um, I'm, I'm very convinced that uh, there is the will and determination to go in this direction and to have a lot closer and much, much, I'm choosing carefully my words now, much, 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 much more cooperation, collaboration, especially with United States. Uh, but also at the level of the European Union member states. And um, the last point I wanted to, to make here, uh, let's not forget, um, if there is one space that is hugely democratized, let me put it like that, where there are no borders and where your friends and enemies are super close, they are one click away, honestly, is the cyberspace. So a lot of things will happen here, uh, my job is to worry about this, and uh, this is what I do. I worry day in, day out. But I'm also very optimistic that uh, we have the will and determination to progress on this. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, I'll move to Mr. Ivashku now. Uh, um, uh, keeping this, uh, this in mind, this idea of uh, collaboration, which was in, the, in the, uh, all of the interventions up until now, uh, it's clear that this is the way. But uh, one thing I was uh, looking at, and I would like to, to ask uh, Mr. Ivashku, Modex is one of the pioneers in the field of blockchain-based uh, solutions. And you mentioned um, uh, in one of your interviews the, that blockchain is in fact the component that digital needed for uh, being trustful and transparent. Um, and trust is uh, overall one of the things we are looking, especially in this uh, space uh, that is uh, we're borderless on one hand, but you don't know who is the friend, the enemy, and uh, and so on. So um, providing trust is, is key for uh, for the, for this. Is this critical or is just a fancy thing to to have uh, right now? Uh, because blockchain seems to be like a fancy word, uh, like uh, cyber was uh, years uh, ago. Uh, is it going to change? Yes, you're right. Um, <laughs> I would like to start from the idea that 90% and remind you all that 90% of the world's data was produced in the last 24 months. So if we put that in perspective, is cyber important? Are technologies that are protecting our most important asset important? I think yes. We started the whole company from the idea that whoever, con from the frustration actually, that whoever controls 
the access to the database is the owner of the truth. Mm -hmm. And blockchain is basically one of those technologies that allows you to have a quantifiable trust in the data set. Talking about the warfare that we're, we're facing right now, we were approached recently by a media agency who said we want to immutabilize the titles of our news. And why is that a problem? Because you can really influence, even for five minutes, if you change the title of a news, it goes live stream, you get the maximum peak, you hit exactly in the middle of the audience, and then you misled. So basically, attacks like this that are, that are being mounted into public opinion are extremely painful. We see that a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of times. Unfortunately, cyber is one of those aspects that cannot be laid out publicly. As the CEO of a bank or as a CEO of an insurance company, you cannot go in a conference like this and explain in detail all of your cyber incidents. But when we speak to them, we find out about a lot of problems and they're really struggling. I'm talking here about private, but also the public sector, where we clearly see the, 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 the real fight over there. But you know, blockchain is one of those technologies that is overhyped for sure, but it's one of those technologies that if you look at the 5% application, there's a lot of substance over there. It has a base in cryptography. Cryptography is one of those um, extremely beneficial technologies that have been used um, for years. And now we see this applied now with a click away. What we try to do in our, in our company is to offer this technology a click away to absolutely all of the enterprises that want to have the type of quantifiable trust in their data sets. The problem is not if you lose your data. The problem is if you, if you have inaccurate data. And as a manager, you need to have reliable data. How do you know that all of the data that all of you have in your spreadsheets is the real one? How do you know that it was not modified this morning? And the report that you're making, taking, making your decisions on is not the accurate one. We don't know that, and I think when we talk about the modern cyber warfare, it it's, involves a lot of deception. And we see that not about shutting down a website, but changing the content on a website or on a database or in a data set so that it's misleading the leaders that are actually deciding on what is to do next. So it is an overhyped technology, definitely, but there's a lot of substance when you look at the real use cases, the real applications around data integrity, data immutability, audit trails, because whatever happens over there, it cannot be changed or altered without the proper check or, or, or winding back. And I think going forward, when we're talking about the high school students that are now basically our hope for the next generations, those guys are already familiar with what trust means because they use it in all of their software that is deployed, all of their games, all of their e-games, all of their activities. They want to have verifiable sources. And for them, it's, they live in this digital age and they want to be able that, to, to prove what is there. In our, in our company, we just want to make those technologies widely available. We want to create meaningful partnerships with technology giants like the ones that we already have. And we want to continue to advance and bring that small part, which is a significant benefit, being applied. And I think the power of blockchain will be when we will not speak about blockchain when we will just speak about the outcome, Trust. like a system of interoperability or an interconnected um, uh, set of databases that are immutably sharing data and are trusted by either the, 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 the person who's operating it, either by other parties. So we're, we're firm believers that this is one of those technologies that will be an infrastructure uh, component of the new 3.0 type of government. Thank you, and uh, I will uh, move uh, just uh, making a quote from uh, uh, from uh, Miss Anna Neuberger. Uh, trust uh, the trust in the core system of the, our society. We need uh, to have visibility and uh, match the consequences if they fall. And uh, you mentioned visibility because uh, you cannot say as a CEO of a bank that you have uh, when what problems do you have, but. In fact, we need to have that visibility, and uh, this is—I uh, resonate very much with uh, Miss 
Neuberger said uh, in an interview uh, quite uh, years ago. Uh, but uh, since we have only five minutes left, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for all the... I let the conversation go and, uh, um, because it's, it's quite meaningful. Uh, I will go back to you uh, uh, and start with Ms. Neuberger uh, asking, uh, like my colleague in the previous session, uh, what would be the key one ingredient that oh, uh, we must uh, have or we must look forward uh, in terms of uh, resilience of this digital space, cyberspace? Uh, we all mentioned collaboration, but what would be, uh, what would be others? Uh, Ms. Neuberger, please. As many of the speakers have talked about the power of what we can do from a cybersecurity and defense perspective is very much in the partnership because we're all using the same or similar technologies. So from the perspective of building more secure technologies, whether it's using the power of government to say, we will only buy technologies that meet certain standards, as we've done in the US, as the European Union has done. So we work collectively to say, when we buy a car, it comes with a seatbelt, it comes with the airbag. When we, buy, when we buy a cloud account, when we buy software, we need to have the confidence that it gives us the visibility as you know it, and that it is secure for the threats it faces today. Similarly, on the data side, right, the data is only collected as it is needed for that given purpose, because as we saw with the hacker when we were a billion accounts in China, any data collection is still subject to human error. So that first piece of building more secure tech and using the power of partnership to call for the same requirements. And then similarly, in terms of defending that technology, technology now is a core component of our societies, particularly as democracies. We want the open exchange of information. So sharing practices, sharing what we put in place, for example, leveraging artificial intelligence to say, this is a normal communication between two protocols. This is potentially anomalous. And then, so broadly across countries that's deployed, I think that's the key difference. And it's where we're at. It's core to the work we're doing in various partnerships. I think, frankly, the work that's happening in Europe now on cyber, driven by the recent invasion of Ukraine, driven by, for example, the, the work that's being done both in the Baltic area, as well as in Western and Eastern Europe, really lays a strong foundation and uh, very much appreciate today's discussion that really emphasize those points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Dudorake, in one minute, what would be the key? Well, partnership the... was used already. Um, yes. So I, if I have to choose one thing, I will choose education. And here I would very much echo and, and fully support what uh, Mr. Kampan and Mr. Ivashko said. Uh, I think without education, um, we, we can't have readiness and resilience when it comes to the cybersecurity that we all need. You can't have awareness. You can't have cooperation, partnerships. You need, uh, you need education. And you need education not only for the kids. They tend to be, because they are digitally native, they tend to have, as Mr. Ivashko was saying already, uh, they tend to have a bit the right reflexes already, uh, but I think we need to invest also in, uh, in competences, abilities such as critical thinking because that is essential for how uh, the, the kids of today but the adults of tomorrow are going to address uh, cybersecurity issues. Uh, and also uh, not forget the current adults who maybe are not digitally native but they need to be themselves aware and equipped at least at, at, at the basic level uh, with what they need to, to know and what they need to do in order to be uh, safe in the digital uh, environment. And I also stress also the issue, because it's linked also to education, the, the issue of the gap of expertise that Mr. Campano was referring to. He said 700,000 at EU level only for cyber. Well, I can tell you the, the gap uh, up to 2030 is estimated at 20 million when it comes to digital jobs in general. So there's a huge expertise gap in Europe, which we need to find a way to plug. Because if not, then uh, we're not going to be ready not only for the whole transformation of our economies driven by digital, but also for being safe and secure and therefore for the cybersecurity objectives we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dan, you have the advantage of having uh, the same uh, countdown. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we just simply need to contribute more. 
to the bilateral or multilateral uh, setup and relationship. So whatever we are doing today, as I said, five times, ten times, we absolutely need to do more. From the Romanian side, we already do this. So we really are a net contributor, I would say, in stability, security, cybersecurity and resilience. We'll continue to do so. We are super, super committed. But personally, I think it's absolutely key that we multiply by five, by ten, everything we are doing today. Mr. Rivașcu, you have the closing. <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, it, it's one of those things that, you know, it's part of the soft power. We should develop cyber resilience as a form of developing soft power. And I think it's not one key ingredient over here. I think it's a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication that has to be put in. And uh, this evolves all the time. Nobody knows exactly how the cyber warfare will look in the next three years looking at quantum. We at blockchain were, were kind of like very scared of quantum until now. Quantum blockchain is a thing, a, a real thing. So we should be always always open to, to, to the new threats and we should invest significantly, maybe 20 times more than we do right now in, uh, in, in, in being competitive. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. A real pleasure to have you uh, here with me today. Thank you, uh, all of you in uh, Washington and Brussels. And um, all of you here and online, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My, my name is Nancy Lachu. I am a journalist covering, covering foreign, foreign affairs, affairs, defense, defense and diplomacy, and diplomacy working, working for the digital TV station. station. And, and today, today I'm the moderator, moderator of, this of this panel. panel. We are going we are to, to talk, talk about the transformation of transatlantic security following, following the NATO strategic concept, concept and the strategic compass of, of the European Union, Union as the as topic of the day. And our guests are, first of all, in person next to me, General Daniel Daniel Chief of Chief Defense Staff of Romania, Romania. and uh, online, online we will, we will be joined, joined by, by Eleanor, Eleanor Hamar, 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 Director General, General for Political, Political Affairs, Affairs Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Affairs of, Sweden. of Sweden, Daniel, Daniel Hamilton, Hamilton, President, President of Transatlantic Leadership, Leadership Network, 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 Network Senior, Senior Fellow of John Hopkins University. University. Size is uh, your uh, done, your done, low deputy, deputy minister of defense, of defense, defense area, area and, and Bashkim Bashkim Hassani, Hassani, deputy, deputy minister, minister of defense, defense Republic of, of North Korea. Korea. Welcome, welcome, welcome all. General, General, General Kuh, I will start, start with you, with you since, since uh, we, are we are together here. here. Uh, NATO, uh, NATO had a fundamental, fundamental change, change at the Madrid, Madrid summer, summer uh, last, uh, last week, week uh, and uh, uh, the eastern flank is now defending more intensively. Basically, there are no differences or there will be, be no differences, differences between, between North and, and South, South when it comes, comes to uh, defense. Um, uh, my, question my question to you is, you is um, um, since all the all allies, the allies from, from the East flank flank already asking, asking for this for, this for this many for years, years, why, why did NATO, NATO need a crisis, crisis in order, in order to, to finally solve this situation? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and good afternoon, and good afternoon, to, afternoon to other distinguished, distinguished panelists. panelists. It is a, it is pleasure, a pleasure, pleasure to be here, to be here. and, uh, and uh, uh, I think having the opportunity to discuss about NATO transformation, about the transformation of a strategic environment, uh, about the role of the new strategic concept, and the opportunity to answer to your question, it's a very timely moment. I have to confess, I'm still under the impression of participating in the Madrid summit, and uh, I'm still under the impression of the discussions we had there. And uh, one of the conclusions that came into conversation was this was a totally historic summit. You know, we say about every summit that is historic, but this is totally historic considering the uh, results, the implications, the role of the strategic concept, but not only the role of the strategic concept, but also of all the other decisions taken in, uh, in Madrid. Uh, it is true that uh, the new strategic concept was adopted by the Alliance during a crisis. The Russian aggression on Ukraine and the impact this aggression has on security. But in the same time, we have to mention and to be aware of the fact that the Alliance has been working on this for a very long time. Uh, I would say that uh, a wake-up moment was 2014 when uh, Russia annexed, illegally, illegally annexed the uh, Crimean Peninsula. And uh, since then, you might recall the decisions in Wales, decision in Warsaw, decision in Brussels. Uh, there were decisions that they were taken gradually. Uh, you might recall the TFP, Taylor Forward Presence in the Northeast, in the Poland, and in the uh, enhanced forward presence in the Northeast, and Taylor Forward Presence for Romania. You may recall, you know, all the reforms regarding the NATO response force um, and all the other measures the Alliance take. Uh, Alliance work on uh, NATO strategy uh, when we uh, try to figure out better how to counter the Russian aggressive and assertive posture and behavior and also how to deal with other security challenges like uh, the terrorism. How to have a 360 degree and even if your question is focused on the eastern flank, I would say the alliance pays attention 360 degrees. And we are getting closer, you know, to realizing, to achieving that balance between the forced posture into the northeast and the forced posture into the southeast. This is the hot spot and the hot line of the alliance. And I think it played a, a role, the fact that Black Sea was recognized as an area of strategic uh, importance for the Alliance, and uh, everything is related to all the other decisions. But because during this panel, 
we discuss about the transformation of the European and uh, transatlantic security in the context of the uh, European Union decisions and strategic planning documents, not only on the NATO strategic planning document. Uh, I think it is important to bring some of the uh, changes I see with the adoption of these uh, strategic documents. And I mean the European Union strategic uh, compass. I will start with the strategic Please. compass first. I think the content of the strategic compass is known to, to, to many people. Uh, many times EU came with strategies and uh, uh, looking into the future and how to deal with the challenges in the future. I think this time it's different in, in my opinion. What I sense from the, uh, from the document, I, uh, I feel a sense of urgency and determination and uh, also I feel uh, something like the EU, it's more proactive because I look at the goals. So the goals are not only to protect our values, to protect our population, to protect the interest of the European Union. Uh, it's also to influence how the world is evolving. And I think without having the goal of influencing how the world is evolving, you cannot be proactive. So it's good we have this goal, and it's good we have this sense of urgency. The, both the strategic compass and the, the NATO strategic planning documents, they emphasize the role of each other organization. So the EU strategic compass clearly mentions the role of NATO in providing security on the European continent and the fact that the NATO is the cornerstone of our common defense and the role of the transatlantic link and the same, the NATO strategic uh, uh, document mentions the role of the European Union and the fact that NATO and EU need to, to work together. And these are planning documents that would influence what we are doing in the future. I think even the decisions in the summit are connected to what is written in the, in the strategic planning uh, documents. Uh, we have done a lot before the summit. Since the conflict in Ukraine started, there was an increase in the force posture on, let's take only our territory in Romania. There were deployments in the land domain, US forces, French forces, Belgian and Dutch forces as part of the VJTF in the NATO response force. Uh, we had enhanced air policing, uh, a lot of contingents coming from Italy, coming from Germany, coming from Great Britain. A Canadian contingent will, will come in the future. So this posture is gradually evolving. Now, I think the road is open for the common defense battle group we have together with France to evolve into a structure than when it's necessary to grow up to the brigade level. The road is open for more US forces to come here. The road is open for regional plans and integration of this. But in all this posture, in everything we do, there is a role of the host nation. We are lucky to reach the decision to provide 2.5% of the GDP for our defense. And uh, we have some line of efforts in using wisely these resources. One line of effort is to increase our readiness. Another line of effort is to integrate very well in our common planning and common activities, the national activities, the host nation support, and also the presence of the allied forces Another important line of effort is to build the capabilities we need for the future, and this uh, new uh, number of procurement program will be started. And uh, another line of effort is the personnel, and I hope we'll be able to provide better conditions for the personnel, for the recruitment, for the education, and so on. So there is an important role of NATO, well depicted in the strategic uh, document, there is an important role for the European Union, but also there is an important role for the national pillar, and we are working on all these levels in order to get everything together. I'm optimistic regarding our posture and our development in the future.
Well, that's, uh, that's a good uh, news to, to be optimistic in general. Uh, I would move on since uh, we said that it's a historical, a totally historical um, summit, the one in NATO. And uh, of course, one historical decision was to have uh, two, two more, more new, new members, members of our, of our alliance. alliance. Let's go, so let's to, go Sweden, to Sweden and, and I will I ask, ask um, Ms. Uh, Elinor Hammarhold, uh, Director uh, General, uh, General for Political Affairs from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Sweden and Finland, of course, you are representing only Sweden um, and speak on behalf of Sweden, but both countries join um, NATO uh, to benefit as well of the American security commitment in the face of Russian aggression. Uh, can you tell us there are other motives as well behind this decision? Uh, thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you for, for uh, um, the invitation to be part of this, uh, this panel. Indeed, I was, I was just about to, to start my intervention by saying that the Madrid summit was certainly historic um, for, for us and for Finland. Um, uh, an extremely important decision for us, of course, to, um, to be invited uh, to join uh, NATO, and we have now completed our uh, accession talks and um, are in the process of, of the ratification process among, among allied countries. Um, we are very grateful for the very strong support that we received from allies uh, in response to our, um, our uh, request to join NATO. I think the point of the, the departure for um, the decision by our government to uh, apply for membership was uh, certainly the uh, the unprovoked uh, and, and unjustified um, Russian aggression against Ukraine, um, which is not only an attack against Ukraine, but also um, against um, uh, the European security order. Um, it was a, a, an example of an aggression against a, a democratic uh, neighbor uh, and, and a, a member of um, of, of our region. Um, and that led to a, um, a discussion in, in Sweden with the, the, between the government and parties in parliament about how should we analyze uh, the, the Russian aggression and its consequences and um, what did that mean for, uh, for Sweden's uh, security policy. And as you all know, um, there was a, a, a unified um, analysis of, of the seriousness of the Russian aggression for security in, uh, in our region as a whole. It is an aggression that, of course, has, has far-reaching and extremely serious consequences, um, not only for our immediate neighborhood, but uh, increasingly also uh, global uh, consequences. But then the, uh, the analysis of our security policy our security situation and a seriously deteriorated security situation uh, for, for Sweden, which uh, led us to, to apply. Um, as a future member, our intention is, of course, to contribute to the security of, of all allies. And we believe that our membership will strengthen um, uh, NATO and, and add to the stability of, of the whole Euro-Atlantic uh, area. And we want to do our part uh, in contributing to NATO's collective defense. Um, when uh, approaching uh, a membership of, of NATO, of course, um, we support the 360 degree uh, approach to security expressed in the new strategic concept. And I think that will help um, address not only the, the challenges that we're facing uh, today, but, but also um, in, in the future. Thank you. And since it's a transatlantic uh, discussion, let's cross the Atlantic and go to Daniel Hamilton. Um, um, I would I like, would to, like discuss to discuss with you, with you about, about uh, NATO enlargements, which are different. different. Um, um, if we if are we talking, are talking about, about countries in countries Eastern in Europe, Europe and Central and Europe, Central Europe. Um, um, those members, those members um, um, are welcome, are of welcome course, uh, but uh, the motivation of their entrance was, was mainly to uh, brought them to certain specific criteria. Yes, and, and also, also to, to 
to develop, develop more their, more their uh, democratic, democratic institutions. institutions. If we, if talk, we talk about Sweden, about Sweden and Finland, and Finland uh, we, talk uh, we talk about two, two um, powerful, powerful countries. countries. Um, um, one of one the motivations motivation that I would say of their, of their uh, joining the alliance was, uh, was the, increase the increase of the vulnerability, of the vulnerability uh, when it comes, when it comes to, to what Russia, what Russia can, do. can do. We already, we already witnessed what, witness what it, can do, it, it, it does in Ukraine. In Ukraine. Uh, uh, if uh, the motivations, if motivations are, different, are different, are the goals are the, the goals same? same? Well, well, I'm not sure, sure the motivations are different. different. Thank, Thank you, you for, for having, having me, me uh, here today. today. And I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be with, with everyone. everyone. You know, enlargement, NATO has enlarged over the course of its entire history. Uh, and so this is nothing new. It's a great new celebration that the open door is real. And uh, I've always thought Sweden and Sweden will contribute tremendously to the alliance. So, but you know, the enlargement of NATO, the open door has always been a basic principle of the alliance because it's connected to the kind of Europe that we would want, like to see. Uh, as uh, President Bush senior said, a Europe that's whole and free. And I still think that that, well, it's a bit daunting to think of that right now, uh, certainly must be still our goal. And that in the essence, in the, in the end, enlargement of the alliance is essentially a political decision because we're entering right now, as we see a ratification phase in which parliaments essentially have to make a decision. In the United States, for instance, two thirds of the US Senate they have one question, will this country add to our strength? That's basically the question. And all, all previous enlargement rounds have been to get countries in a position. So when a US Senator asks that question, the answer is already known and it's yes. And Sweden and Finland are clearly in that camp. Uh, I hope that our Senate will ratify uh, their accession uh, still this month if possible. But we're entering a dicey phase right now where all, all you know, 30 members have to ratify. And this is an opportunity for some mischief on the part of Mr. Putin. So we should, we should you know, be, have resolve here and determination. I, I, I do believe also the NATO summit was historic in many ways, but I'm a bit troubled by sort of some of the self-congratulatory tone here. Uh, you know, we're in a major land war in Europe, the worst since World War II, tremendous civilian casualties, un unbelievable destruction, a determined adversary. And so instead of congratulating ourselves at surprising unity, we should now work from that summit and make some of the things that were said there real. We have to translate the words of that summit into some deeds. So ratification of the accession of these two countries is high. But we have to also turn to a strategic sense of where we want the alliance to go. Uh, I'm not convinced that NATO <clears throat> has a strategy for the Black Sea, for instance. I believe it has uh, strengthened the alliance per se, the alliance members on the Black Sea, but uh, that's not the same thing as thinking about the whole, that whole region, which is becoming quite a strategic importance for all of us. We have to have a, a regional strategy for the Black Sea like we used to have and have had for the Baltic Sea. Uh, we have to understand the rising importance of the Black Sea region. We have to answer countries like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, others, Bosnia, who have you know, our partners of ours and have said they want to be closer to the alliance or even members. What do we say to them now? Uh, there wasn't much said in any detail at the summit. Uh, my colleague, Sandy Birschbau, former Deputy Secretary General of NATO and I have written that we should consider what we call a strategic, uh, a secure neighborhood initiative. That is NATO and the EU should be prepared to provide countries like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, really with everything they need to defend themselves, short of Article 5. And we should couple that with a very strong package of resilience efforts, because much of the war here is not just a conventional land war, it is a, a war of disruption in which Putin is, is you know, uh, weaponizing flows of people, of energy, of food, 
uh, you just name it, the cyber uh, issues you just discussed in the last panel. That means our societies have to become more resilient to that disruption. And not only in the alliance, sort of buried in the strategic concept, but was there is some lines about how our security is intertwined, quote, intertwined with that of those countries. So we need to project resilience forward to partner countries that are weaker and fragile and vulnerable to disruption, because if we don't, all of that nasty stuff comes to us. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, uh, not just preparing these countries to become, draw closer to the alliance so that that US Senator in the end knows what the answer is the next time the real question of enlargement comes up. We have to do the hard work before that. And I still think the summit, while historic and important, uh, still there's still a lot of work that now has to be done uh, in very concrete ways. And we should have a very kind of a steely determination about it and not just pat ourselves on the back. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, uh, last two panelists are uh, representing Bulgaria and uh, North Macedonia, Macedonia, and I have, and the, I have same the same question, question for, for both of both you gentlemen. Of you gentlemen. Um, um, if, if we look, we at, look at Turkey, Turkey Finland, Finland, and Sweden, and Sweden they, managed they managed to overcome, overcome um, um, huge differences, differences at, at, um, the at the NATO summit, summit in Madrid. Madrid. For, the for the sake of the bigger, bigger picture, picture, that means, that means our, our security, security in NATO, in NATO overall. overall. Is it, Is it possible for your, for your both, countries both countries to overcome, to overcome the, the um, historical, historical issue, issue that, uh, that is disputed, is disputed right, right now in order, in order to, to make, make your countries, countries much, more much more stronger both in NATO, in NATO and in Europe? In Europe. Mr. Bozilov, Mr. Bozilov please. please. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you Chair. Chair. Um, it is important question uh, you are putting uh, for, for the discussion. And uh, let me just tell you that um, uh, just uh, several days ago, Bulgarian National Assembly overwhelmingly approved uh, the French uh, presidency's proposal um, providing a, a solution uh, for, uh, for solving uh, the, the, the issues uh, in order to open uh, the door and, and open the way for uh, accession of uh, our uh, friendly uh, neighboring country, uh, North Macedonia. Uh, and uh, we do hope that we'll move uh, pretty fast uh, because uh, actually uh, the, 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 the open door policies of both NATO and uh, EU is, um, uh, is just uh, what we need in order to, to make uh, our regions uh, more, more resilient uh, and, and stronger to cope uh, uh, together. Uh, with, uh, with the common challenges. But uh, let me just uh, come back uh, to, 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 to the Black Sea region because uh, I do see this is uh, the most important now, <clears throat> how to cope with, with the challenges because the, the, the Russian war against, against Ukraine, uh, it, it is uh, a threat uh, to Euro-Atlantic security. It's not just uh, a, a, a regional issue. It, this, this war uh, uh, has far-reaching uh, destabilization implications uh, on, on global level. Uh, that, that's why we have to concentrate uh, uh, and, and look at the Black Sea uh, in order um, to, to, to find uh, the best way to cope with, with this situation. And uh, um, let me uh, tell you that uh, this, this, this conference is uh, an important step towards finding, uh, finding uh, this, uh, this approach. Just last week, uh, on the 1st of uh, July, I was in Constanza in Romania, and I participated in another conference uh, called uh, Black Sea Summit, uh, which was uh, organized by, by the US uh, Helsinki Committee. Uh, and with participation uh, of uh, literal Black Sea countries, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey, uh, Georgia, and Ukraine. And so we discussed many issues. First, we tried to assess the situation and the implication of this situation uh, to the regional and uh, global security. Uh, of course, uh, we strongly supported the decision of Madrid uh, summit uh, for bolstering the alliance's uh, presence uh, 
and then to the eastern flank, uh, we, we also welcomed the, the plans for long-term adaptation uh, of, of NATO. Uh, and of course, we, we all agreed that uh, the Black Sea should be given distinct emphasis uh, uh, we, we, we all agreed that um, we have to uh, uh, make more robust collective defense and deterrence uh, in, in the region. But also we have to uh, strengthen our intelligence, surveillance, information collection, uh, uh, analysis, etc., uh, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what we discussed also uh, and I refer here to, to what uh, Daniel Hamilton said. Uh, we all agreed that we need uh, uh, cooperation between NATO and EU uh, because uh, we are facing uh, different, uh, different crises uh, or crises with different uh, implications. So we desperately need to have this uh, cohesion uh, between uh, NATO and EU. And we also uh, devoted uh, a lot of time discussing the transatlantic link, because it is a key uh, for, uh, for, for the region. We, we, we absolutely need stronger US involvement in the region. We also said that, uh, and we agreed that we need kind of Marshall Plan for, for this region, especially in the military sphere, in order to, um, uh, to, 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 to build uh, defense capabilities. And of course, we, uh, we agreed that uh, it is historic decision uh, to grant a candidate status uh, to Ukraine and Republic of Moldova and European perspective to, to Georgia. It's just, just uh, to mention that uh, uh, there are a lot of a lot of uh, um, events dedicated to, to these issues. And of course, it's the right way to, to, to approach it. Because uh, uh, we, 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 we need uh, first to, to help Ukraine. We need and we have to put pressure on Russia. We have to strengthen the eastern flank. And we have to work with regional partners. This is, this is four key issues uh, we see uh, in order to uh, bring the region to, to, to normality. Uh, of course, as I said, we, we must sustain our support to Ukraine as long as uh, it's needed until Russia stops the aggression and withdraws its troops uh, from Ukrainian territories. We have to think also uh, about helping Ukraine to cope with the consequences of this war, including to think about uh, future reconstruction uh, of the infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned that we have to put more, more pressure on, on, uh, on Russia in order to, to stop the, the, the invasion. We have to have uh, uh, long-term uh, defense and deterrence uh, measures by NATO to, 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 to make the eastern flank uh, uh, much stronger in, in uh, military, uh, from the military perspective. And of course, we have to work with, with the regional partners. And uh, uh, having in mind the NATO strategic concept and the EU strategic compass as a key documents which will lead this organization in the years ahead, we have, we have to, 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 to stand on that uh, basis and to, as it uh, was uh, mentioned by, I think, uh, also Daniel, to try to uh, uh, elaborate comprehensive Black Sea strategy. And here we have NATO as a, a, a strong, uh, stronger military power, so we, we can rely on NATO mainly uh, to, to provide uh, 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 de deterrence and defense measures for the Black Sea region. But also we have to see uh, 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 better involvement, stronger involvement, strong commitment uh, from the uh, European Union in order to cope uh, with all these uh, issues like uh, uh, hybrid you know, warfare, disinformation and propaganda, weaponization of security supplies, cyber attacks. So we have, we have to work together in order to uh, uh, really cope with, uh, with this uh, uh, very, very dangerous situation uh, which actually Russia put us. 
Mr. Hassani, looking forward for your answer as well to the same question. I will repeat it. Is it possible that Bulgaria and yeah, North and Macedonia, Macedonia to overcome, overcome their, uh, their historical, uh, historical issue and move on, move on to, to, to be more be safe more in both in NATO, NATO and Europe? In Europe? I think, I think yes. yes. With, With me, me and my, and my dear, dear friend, friend Bozilov, will be, will be everything, everything okay. okay. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everyone. everyone. Thank you Thank for you your invitation. invitation. Respected, Respected panelists, dear friend, friend, friend Mr. Bozilov, at the very beginning, I would like, like to thank, thank organizers of the Aspen Institute of Romania for this opportunity to contribute to the Atlantic Black Sea Security Forum and be a panelist on the exceptionally valid topic. We live in a moment of strategic rivalry and complex and complicated security threats, hybrid threats evolved in frequency and consequences. The war against Ukraine substantiates that Europe is in an even bigger danger than we thought just a few months ago. For both the NATO and EU, Russia is a direct security threat. The Russian Federation has violated the rules and principles that contribute to a stable and predictable European security order. The very principles are at stake, upon which international relations are built, not least those of the UN Charter and the Helsinki Final Act. History is accelerating once again. We are, we are aware that, that advisors have challenged the security of the Euro-Atlantic area and the wider region that this area is neighboring. Today, than ever, ever before, before they are more vulnerable to new threats and challenges than ever. ever. The threats we face are global and interconnected. If we want to live in a free world, we need to act fast and with the strength of will, of will as well as, well as that my mind to adapt, adapt to deal, deal with issues challenging, challenging world security. security. Both, Both NATO and, and the EU needed to act, act in synergy, synergy to protect, protect role-based role international, international order, order and preserve human, human rights, rights and, and fundamental freedoms, freedoms universal values and international, international law. To do, to, do this, to do this, this both, both NATO, NATO and the EU need to transform, transform on time, time. increase their resilience and, and develop appropriate mechanisms and tools to address, address raising challenges and, and security, security threats. threats. Currently, both, both the EU and NATO, and NATO are at are historic crossroads and are adopting their strategies and with, and with this, this process, process they, are they are not competing with, with each, each other. other. They work, they work simultaneously to, to address security challenges that may destabilize countries in the world. However, this is not a competition between them, them but one, one complements to all other, and if one is made to avoid duplication and the development of needed capabilities. The NATO 2030 reflection process was the first step undertaken which resulted in the adoption of the new strategic concepts of the aliens at the Madrid summit week ago. Commonly a few months ago, EU promulgated its strategic compass, both for stone documents and enable proper consultation, cooperation and coherence. The strategic concept enables allies in an environment of strategic competition to develop needed capabilities to deter, defend, contest, and deny adversaries' actions across all remaining and direction, in line with a 360-degree approach. NATO's deterrence and defense posture are based on an appropriate mix of nuclear, conventional and missile defense capabilities, complemented by space and cyber, cyber capabilities with which it becomes stronger, resilient and ready to act in real time. It will follow by strengthening its force, structure and postures as an amplification of deterrence and defense able to deny and potential adversaries and possible opportunities for aggression. All members need to work in that direction. 
NATO cannot do all this alone. NATO needs to work closely with partners not only in Europe, but also with all open-minded partners across the globe. However, however, European Union is its end and will remain a unique and essential partner for NATO. Interconnection with the EU is accelerating the strength of NATO as a partner that is more capable of sharing the burden of maintaining international peace and security. NATO allies and EU members share the same values. NATO, NATO and the, and the EU, EU play a complementary, coherent, and new total reinforcing roles in supporting. They need, they need to enhance their, their cooperation, cooperation in different domains of common interest in line, line to avoid unnecessary duplication. It provides a, a comprehensive impetus. Not, not only to only the effort, effort of the, of the uni 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 uh, Union, union but, but also, also to, to other, other European, European countries. countries. And, and in, in the end, consideration expressed in both strategic documents are relevant to all countries from Europe and beyond, beyond. and, and urge common effort for mutual, mutual difference, difference and security achievements, achievements and, and benefits. benefits. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. To uh, General, uh, General Pesco, I will come back, come back to you. To you. And because, and because uh, it was it mentioned, was mentioned a, lot, a lot, the Black Sea, the Black Sea, the Black, the black strategy, strategy, the Black Sea region, uh, region is, uh, in this, in this uh, strategic, strategic new concept, new concept from, Madrid, from Madrid, mentioned a couple of times, but as uh, Mr. Hamilton said, there is no strategy yet. What a comprehensive strategy of the Black Sea means? I would start with the fact that NATO has a military strategy which deals with 360 degrees approach and it deals with Russia as a threat and also deals with the terrorist threat. I think this general strategy gives the necessary in order to start focusing on different areas. The Baltic is important, the Black Sea is important, Mediterranean is important, the Balkans are important. In the today's world, everything is interrelated. All these security challenges are interrelated. Uh, NATO has also a concept for deterrence and defense. This concept for deterrence and defense, within this con uh, concept, is nested what we do with the GRPs, graduated response plans, what we do with regional plans. You know, having these plans ready, having a clear command and control architecture, having assigned forces for different tasks and for these different regions will be another step forward. What we do more in the Black Sea, what I can think of right now, I think we need to recognize more that it's not only a military part, even if the Black Sea is very much influenced by the conflict the, between Russia and Ukraine, but it has also an economical part, it has also a diplomatic part, it has also an informational part. So in today's world, you cannot solve issues alone and you cannot solve issues using only military force or using only diplomacy. So towards that strategy, I would argue, you know, for more involvement, not only military input, but also inputs regarding all the other instruments of power. If we go back to Sweden, uh, we have we 10 have more 10 minutes, more minutes uh, uh, so, uh, so I would so like, I would for, like uh, for a shorter, shorter answer, answer starting, starting now, if now possible. If possible. Uh, my, uh, my question, question is, is um, uh, both, both again, again Finland, Finland and Sweden, and Sweden uh, are very are strong very countries, strong countries and, and both of them are, are let's say, let's better prepared, prepared, prepared for, for uh, than, uh, than many other allies inside, inside NATO, NATO to defend their territories as well. Their financial situation is better than other members of NATO. Will this uh, be used uh, when you will become member uh, to, I don't know, to, to support more, let's say, the Baltic region in, uh, in defavorizing the other regions? Well, is it, thank you. As you indicate, we have a long-standing um, partnership with NATO and both Sweden and Finland have 
as enhanced partners of NATO, work very, very closely and, and have achieved a level of interoperability, which, which we believe will make it uh, certainly easier for us as, as we join, uh, join NATO. Um, we also strengthened the modalities of our interaction with NATO as, as a response to the Russian aggression uh, earlier this year, which, is, which has strengthened our cooperation further. I think at this stage, um, I think it's the important thing to say is that um, we are preparing to, to take on um, all the tasks of a, a future um, member of NATO, uh, both the core tasks of collective defense and crisis management and, and cooperative security. Can I just um, comment on, on a couple of things that were said, which I think were, were very important um, by the other panelists. Um, one is the, the point made by uh, Professor Hamilton on, on us not congratulating ourselves too much. And I take that point. Um, I think there's no doubt about the deep seriousness of the security um, crisis we're facing as a result of the Russian aggression. What I do think we should be um, taking forward is the importance of the transatlantic unity that we have been able to maintain um, uh, over this period. Uh, that is a strategic strength in response to uh, Putin's aggression. And we need to work um, actively to maintain it. And certainly as we look forward, both in terms of how uh, the EU should be working and the EU should be working together with NATO, maintaining that transatlantic unity in our response to the aggression and our support to Ukraine is a critical uh, strength. The other point that I'd like to pick up on very briefly is, is the point um, of we have work to do. And I think one key dimension to that is really using uh, the full range of our tools. Um, and in that respect, I'll, I'll just say that I think here, there is a complementarity uh, between EU and NATO that is also um, of, of great value. The strategic compass of the EU shows the comparative advantage of the European Union, the combination of the civilian, the military tools that we have at, at our disposal. And that is, of course, um, in addition to the collective defense, which is, which is NATO's uh, uh, task. And translating that into this key region that we're talking about today, the Black Sea region, I think there's a, there's a strong point that has been made by other speakers on the need for us to use our toolbox to support resilience um, of, um, uh, in, in this region in, uh, in relation to uh, Ukraine's neighbors and um, to, to really look ahead at the, the threats, uh, including the non-military threats that partners will be facing ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Hamilton, in the, uh, strategic, uh, the, new, strategic the new strategic concept, concept uh, from Madrid, from Madrid. Uh, it, was it was also mentioned, also mentioned China, China as a security, as a security threat. threat, and, and uh, of, course, of course everyone, everyone agreed that, that uh, something, something must, must be done, be done in, in this regard. This. Uh, it's a new strategy. Uh, but China is different from Russia. Is NATO creative enough to give two separate responses to those threats? I believe it is. Uh, before I get to that, let me just make one comment. There's been a lot of discussion about NATO and EU working together. There's a third piece of this that needs to work together, and that's the US and the EU. And of all the relationships we have, this is the weakest read. It's the deep, we are most deeply connected than any other two partners in the world, the United States and the European Union, where it's a dense, dense relationship. And yet we have failed repeatedly to turn that close relationship into a strategic partnership. Uh, we're always embroiled in bilateral disputes. We just never turned our potential into something real. And for all the kinds of challenges we're talking about, as, as General Petrescu said, and Mrs. Hammarskjöld, beyond the military, it's the US and the EU that have to make a real difference here. So I'm hoping that the Swedish presidency, I'm looking at Mrs. Hammarskjöld, uh, might take this on as a priority to turn the US-EU relationship into something strategic so we can get beyond this sort of pettiness that all, always you know, divides us. 
you know, we, we, there's so much to build on. We, we, that, that's part of the work to do. And it's a, it's a missing link. And it, you know, if you think about it, the US Senate has to vote or ratify on NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty. But of all the actors in the United States, the weakest link with the European Union is the US Senate. There's no relationship between the US Senate and the European Union at all. Uh, there's a transatlantic legislators dialogue that's only members of the House of Representatives. Senators don't even participate. So we have some dichotomies here that we need to work on, and I would hope that we could do that, and I think Sweden has always been a champion of that, so I'm hoping that that's a possibility. When we talk about 360 degree uh, vision, it has to include uh, areas beyond Europe. And I think what the strategic concept is trying to say, and, and again, what I've been saying a bit more directly, is that when we think about China, it's not about sending NATO over to the Indo-Pacific. It's not about you know creating a new NATO in, the, in Asia. It's how the North Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific are now strategically linked. It's not an either or choice. Things that are happening in the Pacific are affecting European security and vice versa. We have to consider this as an integral effort and not as sort of a trade-off. It's not about pivoting anywhere. It is about thinking of how we have to deal with the challenge that China presents. China's challenge is not the same as Russia. Uh, NATO did not say China is a threat. It's a systemic challenge. The US and the EU have basically been saying something very similar. Um, and so our, what we need to do is think about how to uh, build on that insight. So uh, much of, you know, it's not about us pivoting to Asia, it's that China has pivoted to Europe. China is now a, a power in Europe. Uh, investment in strategic ports, uh, it, it is uh, buying uh, strategically relevant defense related companies. Uh, it's engaged in a whole series of activities, especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, that tries to sort of crack the alliance. Uh, and I would urge my East, Central East European friends to really reconsider what they're doing with China. Um, those are all things, you know, beyond NATO. But China is challenging the global commons, the basic principles of border that uh, are freedom of navigation, freedom of maritime security, freedom of information, freedom of outer space. Uh, all of these things that bind us and on which Europe is the main champion in the world and most dependent on those principles being upheld, it, it, this is in danger, danger of being, being eroded. eroded. So, so China's, China's challenge, challenge is you know, multifaceted. multifaceted. We, have we have to approach, approach it through, through all, all of our channels. channels. NATO, NATO is part, is part of, it, of it, but it's, it's not it's it's where NATO, NATO fits, fits into that challenge, challenge rather, rather than NATO, NATO is the answer, answer uh, to, uh, to it. it. So I, so think, I think we have, we have to think, think harder, harder about, about the 360 degree. degree. And, and with, with all the European, European countries, countries now pledging, pledging more, more money, money for defense, defense and the strategic, strategic concept, concept issue, should, you, you should project that over, over the 10 year, ten year period. period. What, what is, is the goal actually of all that money? money? Just spending, spending more is isn't necessarily spending, spending well. well. And, and the US, US is going to be caught between its need to do issues in the Pacific and the North Atlantic. And if there's a simultaneous challenge from China and Russia, the United States might not be there in the ways that Europeans hope it will be. So we need to we need to have an ambitious target going forward, not a strategic economy, which is a word that I think divides, but but what our Finnish friends call strategic responsibility. And I would define it very simply that Europe over the next decade needs to be able to provide half half of the capabilities and enablers to deter and defend against Russia. It doesn't even do half the job right now. And secondly, it should provide the, the enablers, enablers and capabilities to be the first, first responder, responder to crises, to crises all along the southern, southern periphery. Europe should, should be the first responder. responder. We should, we should not, not have, have to have, have US, US Air Force, Force uh, planes fly, fly French, French soldiers to Africa, Africa because, because they can't get to the themselves. Cells. Things, Things like, like that. that. We, we have, have to have, have a, a more ambitious, ambitious goal to promote, promote European, European capabilities, capabilities that may reinforce the transatlantic link. In, in my mind, mind that would be the 360-degree uh, vision. Thank, thank you.
And the, and the last question, question is also, is also for, for the last, the last two, two guests, guests is, the is the same question, question and please uh, respond briefly. briefly. We observe we that the uh, uh, goal of uh, Vladimir Putin, Putin is to, is to uh, divide, divide the uh, NATO, NATO allies, allies especially, especially on issues, on issues uh, like uh, topics like, like um, the bilateral disputes your country, your country has. has. Um, um, do you feel do it you feel in it your countries? I mean, I mean uh, we need, uh, uh, let me put it in this way, comprehensive approach uh, to security. We need it uh, more than ever. Uh, uh, from one side, we have to strengthen uh, the flank militarily, but on the other side, we have to put more attention to the development of civil society, to strengthening our democracies, rule of law, fighting corruption. Uh, we have to have uh, uh, effective stratcom tackling disinformation. Uh, of course, we have to, uh, to overcome dependency uh, from Russia on, on many issues, including uh, energy. So only uh, looking through this prism of uh, you know, comprehensiveness, uh, we can succeed against uh, uh, Russian aggression, uh, which, which is not only against Ukraine, but it's also against us. Mr. Hassani? I be very I would be very strongly we feel that in our, our countries that big, big pressure, pressure from uh, Russia, Russia to uh, destabilize our country. country. I, I think, think it's same in, in uh, Bulgaria, but, but uh, we think we will be together, and in the end we will be part, strong, together, and, and united. Let's make Let's it make so. It Thank, so. Thank you so much, everyone, everyone for, participating for participating to the panel. In less than 10, 10 minutes, minutes, we'll have, we'll have another, another panel, panel here, here at the, the, the uh, Aspen, Aspen Institute, Institute conference. conference. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the last but not least panel of today's fourth edition of the Atlantic Black Sea Security Forum. Um, I think the topic of this panel is uh, interesting enough to keep everyone um, on their toes, attentive after this long day of discussions, but very, very interesting discussions. So uh, my name is Clara Volintiru. I am the program director for the New Economy and Society program at the Aspen Institute, and it is my great pleasure to moderate today's panel, uh, which not only deals with an important topic, as I just mentioned, a new Marshall Plan for Eastern Europe, something we've all been discussing in different events for the past months, and I think today's conversation will add substance to this regional debate, regional conversation in the transatlantic sphere. But the other very interesting point of this panel is the lineup of panelists, amazing um, uh, speakers, I might say. I, I know them from past events, but uh, without my subjectivity involved, let me introduce Mr. Florin Spataru, Minister of Economy uh, of Romania, Mr. Spataru. Also with us, Professor Emmanuel Dupuis, President of the Institute for European Perspective and Security Studies. And our former acting president at the Aspen Institute, many, many roles uh, filled over, or over time, Mr. Mas Vasile Yuga, founder and partner of Valorem Business Advisor and still treasurer of the Aspen Institute. So I will give you the floor for introductory remarks, and then we will try to maintain a dynamic conversation as possible to um, entertain this important topic in the context in which the Ukrainian economy has been severely crippled by the current war, and the discussion of the need for a Marshall Plan to, to rebuild Ukraine. Let us focus on the region and what Romania can bring to, um, to this conversation and to this project. Mr. Spataru. Thank you very much. It's a very, in fact, it's a very interesting topic. Let's say a Marshall Plan. We didn't experience that already from, uh, from the end of the Second World War. But also we didn't experience in Europe uh, a crisis, a uh, war at such a magnitude close to our border. And this is uh, also uh, giving us the um, giving us the, the, the responsibility, in fact, to reconstruct Ukraine, to rebuild, let's say, what has been destroyed in the last couple of months. I do believe that uh, reconstruction of Ukraine is the responsibility of a civilized European society. And we all all the countries of the European Union need to, 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 to adhere to that, and we need to contribute to this. On the other hand, if we look a little bit when the reconstruction of Ukraine is going to start, I would say that that has been started already in the first day of the war. Why? Because there were thousands, millions of refugees who left Ukraine trying to find an escape, a solution for them, for their families, and to survive in the, in the coming period. And what happened? Poland and Romania, the countries who are very, let's say, at the border of Ukraine, they offered already from the first day the support. The support which, uh, it was the humanitarian support, on the first, in the first instance, but also the, government, uh, the Romanian government made possible for thousands of people, of Ukrainian people, to have a job, to be integrated in the society, to offer to the children the possibility to learn. And that's the base of the reconstruction of Ukraine. Because at a certain moment, those people will go back to Ukraine. And they will, they will continue to, to, to work, because I know let's say that they are proud people, they, they, they are proud of being Ukrainian, they are completely uh, disrupted by what is happening, but they have their families there and definitely they, are going, they will go back to, uh, to their place. There were companies who were having, um, they were having the, um, uh, let's say, offices in Romania and offices in Ukraine. 
And I know from my past experience that there were people who started to continue to work in Romania at the, under the same umbrella, in the same company, but not in Ukraine and in Romania. And that was possible. I have this, uh, this personal experience with uh, something like 50 engineers in the shipbuilding sector who uh, continue to work, in, uh, to work in Galatz because they have been moved from, uh, from a almost destroyed Nikolaev. That's, the, let's say, the base, and that's how Romania is contributing right now to the, to, to the reconstruction. But definitively, it is going to continue. Definitely, Romania will have, let's say, a very significant input being at the border of uh, Ukraine in the reconstruction. We also started to, to, to make the link in the infrastructure in Galatz. They have finalized, uh, let's say, the railway line, which is transporting the, the grains from Ukraine, and they continue to do the business not like they used to do before, but they are continuing to do the business, let's say, in order to survive, to have the proper funding for the, for the people uh, working there, for the people fighting there. And that's, let's say, a very important aspect we, which we have to, to, to show it to, uh, to Europe, that we are prepared for that. We ha will play a, a key role in that, and in the whole setup of, uh, let's say, reconstruction, which will take years, significant amount of money is going to, is going to be, let's say, allocated for that. Europe is uh, announcing this, United States is announcing that, but it's not only about the money. It's about the people, it's about uh, the countries, it's about the business continuity, as we all know that it has to be. And uh, from that perspective, I would, uh, I would say that the strategic position of Romania and the advantages of Romania, uh, let's say, already starting from the first day of the war, will be the, role, the key role in the reconstruction of the future of Ukraine. Thank you. Professor Dupuis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, of course, have to thank the organizer for this wonderful event and this day of very incentive um, perspective. I have to say that Marshall Plan is not only about big money. It was about big money when it was created in 1848. Everyone knows what was the angle of that reconstruction of a devastated country during four years, 1948, 1962 with one country having the capacity to do it, United States, helping the reconstruction of Europe. But it's also about a transformation of Europe, a new mindset to reshape and rebuild common endeavors. Of course, uh, being led by uh, the reshaping of a stronger Europe, and of course, having in mind the fight against communism. Can we therefore say that we need a new Marshall Plan for Eastern Europe? Well, it depends on what you intend to think and take of the Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan came before European Union or the construction of a collective European Union. It therefore paved the way for a more collaborative uh, bilateral and then common, a combination bilateral Franco-German and then communitarian perspective. Therefore, thinking that we need a new Marshall Plan is a bit worrying because we have Europe. We don't need a new Marshall Plan. We need a bigger, stronger European plan in order to rebuild and reshift what is needed in the outskirts of Europe, of course, uh, in, on the eastern pillar. Saying that, uh, we also have to think of what lies between the Marshall Plan of yesterday and the new Marshall Plan of today, which is Europe in a more global perspective. And this is where I want to bring my um, presentation. Of course, it's about Eastern partnership failure. It's about the collapse of OSCE. It's about the need to have a new momentum, which is, of course, different from 1994, when we thought, with the partnership of peace, with the memorandum of Budapest, or in Corfu in 2009, that we could shift or maybe liaise or have a discussion, fruitful discussion, with Russia at that time. Remember, in June 2009, in the Corfu conference, where 
we thought that Dmitry Medvedev was eager and, I say, honest broker, saying that he wanted a new peace, confidence-built architecture for confidence uh, architecture for Europe. Now we have to tackle a solution and a, a, a reality in where Russia, and this was said and first said in the NATO summit in Madrid, and prior to that in the G7 meeting in Schloss Elmo, where Russia is no longer a partner, but an adversary, a clear adversary to all of the 27 European countries and the 30 NATO members, and of course the 21 European countries inside NATO, which of course brings us to think that if we are to believe that we need a Marshall Plan, it's not only for the sake of the reconstruction of Ukraine, it's because we have a certain number of, let's say, gaps inside the European uh, agenda. Western Balkans is one, Southern security or the common uh, endeavor or the common perspective of the, so so the southern security of flank, so southern flank, security of the southern flank of NATO or the so southern so flank of European Union, and of course uh, taking in, in consideration that instead of overlapping new organization, instead of recreating something which has been created before, we need to invent something new. I'm speaking as a Frenchman. I have in front of me the ambassador Laurence Auer. President, President Macron proposed a new initiative, La Communauté Politique Européenne, European Political Community. Of course, it's about clustering more than uh, uh, differentiating the uh, European partners. It's about speaking of the, uh, let's say, the faults or the uh, non-engagement that was taken in Zagreb in 2003 concerning Western Balkan open door policy. We have been not uh, dedicated and not committing sufficiently on that. Saying all of this brings me to, because for the sake of time I will not be so long as a scholar, saying that a Marshall Plan is needed not only for the reconstruction of Europe, or the eastern part of Europe, but a reconstruction plan is needed for the sake of European Union to be a global actor. And this Marshall Plan has various names. For example, it is called the European Union Global Gateway, which was presented by Ursula von der Leyen in September 2020. G7 proposed a partnership for global infrastructure and investment, which was called prior to this the Build Back Better World, B3W, Again, this is a grand plan, and this is important because some of our adversaries or our systemic partners, or systemic adversary, it depends on how you see it, already have this Marshall Plan. Belt and Road Initiative for China. The new corridor linking St. Petersburg to Bandar Abbas in Iran and to Bombay. This was launched a few days ago between President Putin and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So let's big, let's wider the picture. What happened in Lugano is important. We have this dedication to bring 750 billion of, of dollars. This was said by Denis uh, Schmigal, the Prime Minister of Ukraine, but it's not only that. Bringing money is essential but the amount that was raised or the amount that was mentioned in Lugano will unfortunately not be sufficient as we are speaking of a reconstruction now when the war is still going on. Do remember that the Marshall Plan happened after the war and the Marshall Plan came as a response to what the Soviet Union was creating, the Comicon, the Economical Mutual Assistance Council. So these are some of the issues I wanted to raise, but again, I do agree that we need to build something new, that we have to revisit the mutual cooperation or the mutual perception that we have on Eastern Europe, South Eastern Europe, that there is not a difficulty of having a very communitarian perspective on 27 countries, with 27 countries or 37 NATO members. But again, we may be in the necessity to cluster a bit. I know that doing this in, in Romania with the B9 countries, for example. The Visegrad 4 is another example. French president proposed an old idea, which was proposed by François Mitterrand in 1990, to bring a community, a political community, and I will finish by that, where the essential issue is on, on the change of methodology. It's not if, but when European Union 
partners will have the capacity to enter. It's about a political commitment rather than economical or judicial or uh, juridical criteria, acquis communautaire, as we said, because if we stick to that, the 35 chapters, Ukraine will not enter the European Union between before 10 to 15 years. Turkey has been waiting since 1987, and a certain number of countries. We had that the example with Albania, well, Albania, North Macedonia, for example, or Montenegro have been waiting for at least 30 years, 20 to 30 years. So these are some clear commitments I wanted to put in the debate. And, and we can definitely get back to them. So we have the operational urgency that Romania is providing support for the humanitarian crisis, for the business reallocation. We have the geopolitical perspective. Mr. Yuga. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I will start by saying that having a Marshall Plan for Ukraine after 75 years from the launch of the original Marshall Plan is highly symbolic. And uh, uh, we read in the history books that um, the initial, the original Marshall Plan started as an economic reconstruction program, uh, which turned into an economic miracle, but which went much beyond uh, and which built trust and which was the beginning of a long-standing transatlantic relationship. Uh, and the legacy of uh, the original Marshall Plan is very strong today. If we look at Ukraine, as Professor Dupuy said, we call it Marshall Plan, but it's a Marshall Plan in a completely different context. And the ambition must be big for Ukraine as well, and must not be limited to the economic reconstruction. It has to do with the integration of Ukraine into the Western world. This is the, should be the final objective. And this will require the if the reconstruction of the social, economic, social, political, and environmental and human infrastructure, if you want. Differences already mentioned by Professor Dupuy and by Minister present here today from the original Marshall Plan. We start early. We, do, we must do it in a structured and organized way using a multilateral approach rather than bilateral deals. And it must involve, involve a large number of stakeholders, again, different from the original Marshall Plan. We have the G7, we have the United States, we have the European Union, we have the international financial institutions. We must have probably IMF as well involved. And last but not least, very importantly, we will have to have the private sector crowded in. And this must be based on the seven principles which have been agreed in the, at the Lugano conference. I'm not in the interest of time, I'm go, not going to list all of them, but this is more, much more than an economic assistance program. It's about building and rebuilding a society and a country which is going to be integrated and connected to the Western world. We have at the same time uh, the need, there is a need to balance long term and short term. In the long term, we, we are all talking about 750 billion euros, maybe a trillion euros for the reconstruction. But what is important is to survive the short term. And let me share with you some numbers on the short term. Currently, the monthly deficit in Ukraine is around, give or take, five billion euros per month. Foreign reserves of the National Bank of Ukraine are around 30 billion euros. At the current rate, these will be exhausted in six months. Uh, we have to keep, in the short term, Ukraine functioning. And in this respect, assistance is required. And there is, in order to stabilize the macroeconomic, the, fi the, the fiscal, and the budgetary uh, position of Ukraine. Already talks about 9 billion euros to be committed by the European Union. Uh, EBRD, 
and IFC around 3.5 billion. EIB a similar amount. Strong commitment, but no number yet from the uh, G7. Uh, and then United States around nine billion dollars plus potential an additional four billion from international disaster assistance. So lots of money being discussed, but it is critically important to have, if you want, a guardian looking at how this entire process is managed. And probably IMF is in the best position to do the monitoring of the macro financial assistance program to Ukraine, because this is going to add credibility uh, to the, if you want, decision makers in the Western democracies that money are properly spent. And this is, I think, hugely important. Uh, now, maybe two other comments, very brief comments. Uh, yes, Ukraine has been, I mean, the, the private sector fled. He's no longer involved in Ukraine. Um, Ukraine currently has a public debt of 100 billion euros, give or take, in equivalent, out of which 50% is foreign debt. So not a huge debt, however, Maybe it would be worth to look and have a debt restructuring for Ukraine, at least for the foreign part, including maybe a partial relief. Uh, that, that would be important. And uh, then to establish, again, for short term, if you want, lifelines to, to provide liquidity and to reassure the financial markets would be to have a bilateral swap line between National Bank of Ukraine and European Central Bank and potentially the, the Federal Reserve in order to bring, if you want, back the private sector in the financing of Ukraine. So uh, in a nutshell, we have to balance and plan for the long term, but we have to manage the challenges of the short term. And in order to do this, Ukraine must be, uh, say, the, the process must be credible and must be owned by Ukraine and properly monitored and controlled by the donors. More details in the yes. Q&A session potentially. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry this uh, very um, generous topic has uh, a limited time frame. I'm going to come back to the operational um, urgency perspective that Minister Spataru mentioned, the initial measures that Romania can offer in support of the humanitarian, the labor market of Ukraine, but also of the business continuity. And I would like to link it to the financial perspective that Mr. Yuga just mentioned. Romania has the commitment, the values to stand right next to Ukraine, but does it have the financial um, instruments now, today, to do more for Ukraine? And what should be done on our government side to promote such efforts? So first of all, I think the, the commitment of the Romanian government to, to support Ukraine is, let's say, by far, let's say, the, one of the most valuable things uh, which uh, has been done and is continuing to be done. Second is, um, as, let's say, my, uh, my colleagues were saying, um, money is not everything. Yeah, money will be available, and there are, let's say, statements that they will be, they will put on, the, let's say, um, they will be available for the for the construction of Ukraine. Romania needs to develop the ability to come with projects, mm. and to 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 let's say to create the ecosystem which includes the resources of Ukraine, and create a regional ecosystem in that, uh, from, from that perspective. Because there, it will be much easier to, to, to let's say, to, um, uh, to continue in a smooth way the transition and start, uh, start uh, building on that. What we, what we did, but this is including in a much larger, uh, let's say, uh, perspective, we, we have started to, to think on relocating the businesses from the Far East and from the other countries back to, back to Europe. We might not see, but that it will be also beneficial for Ukraine. Because, uh, let's say, a, a, re, 
positioning the supply chain, uh, supply chain uh, back in Europe, it is also, let's say, allowing the other uh, the, the companies to, let's say, create different, uh, let's say, production entities or industrial entities uh, in, the, in the region. And definitely, the clear message of Europe that Ukraine is in the process of being, uh, let's say, accepted in the European Union, it is also playing its important role. Yeah. We have seen, let's say, the, that when a new country has been, uh, has been accepted in the European Union, the neighbors were helping them to, 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 to continue to develop. And Romania is the neighbor, is in, is, uh, the neighbor of Ukraine. So, we did. Now we have a plan to, to attract uh, companies, let's say, back and to support also the Ukrainian entities to, uh, to have the business uh, continuity. But we also need to further expand this, uh, this capacity because then it will be much easier for Romania to be the bridge, to be the, 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 the uh, let's say, the intermediate step on let's say, transferring the know-how, transferring the knowledge, bringing specialists there, and why not also helping in the development of the infrastructure. And I think that's, uh, let's say, that's something what, uh, what uh, let's say, uh, needs to be done, and we are continuing continue to do that. And it's also very important that Romania stands actively in the conversation regarding the reconstruction. Mm. Because it's important to be there, to be active, to come with proposals, to come with the solutions, and let's say, uh, support the whole process of uh, a civilized and unified European Union. To provide a regional hub. This is uh, what Romania has been striving for for a long time. I'm going to turn to Professor Dupuy. And I'm going to, you know, I, I empathize with your perception, and it was mentioned today uh, several times, the, the um, let's say, weight of having to face another war in Europe, the weight of having to face the need for a Marshall Plan. So uh, the, the sense of um, drama let's say, that we, we are facing these days was something that we did not anticipate a few years ago. But how credible do you think a unified action plan is in Europe today when the economic crisis is hitting throughout the Central and Eastern Europe, when the political divides are more and more visible within Central and Eastern Europe? So how credible is this European common action towards Ukraine? Are there more more uh, relevant countries uh, or relevant partners than others, or are they all standing together? Well, this, your question allows me to amplify a bit my, 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 my answer. Um, I think there's a very huge difficulty, or I think a huge endeavor, in only thinking that democracy-based countries, like-minded democracy, have the only right to reconstruct Ukraine. It's not only about G7, it's also about G20. It's about the 141 countries who decided the 2 of March to, this, to say that Russia was not right invading Ukraine. I think there is a huge danger in thinking that reconstruction of Ukraine will only be the right of the rich country. I think it's a global perspective, because if we do that, then of course the countries who will be suffering from hunger Antonis Gutierrez spoke about a hurricane of hunger. He spoke about two billion inhabitants who have been directly struck by the Ukraine crisis. 94 countries having a direct impact. If we think that the reconstruction of Ukraine is only the story of Europe, G7, NATO, European Union, I think we're missing the point. It's about a global perspective of what a democracy is, and how it can be defended by everyone inside the global multilateral system. Because if we do not do that, then a certain number of our African friends will turn to us and say, OK, you're doing this for Ukraine. Why haven't you done that in Libya in 2011, in Mali in 2012? What, why are you not doing it in Central Africa today, or maybe in Ethiopia in a few days or a few months, if, you, if I may so? So I think this, 
urgency to believe that international community has to be engaged in the reconstruction of Ukraine, and it's not only about G7 countries, not only about a European Union plan or the land and lease democracy Ukraine plan which was proposed and signed by President Biden a few weeks ago. I think it's important to understand this because, and I will respond to the question, if we have a Ukraine fatigue in our public opinion, it's precisely because of that. It's because the public opinion only think that we're doing this for let's say, pragmatical, short-term reason. No, if we build a community, then Ukraine is a model, it's an exemplary, it's a laboratory. As the United States thought that the reconstruction of Europe was a necessity to rebuild, to reboost its democracy model in 1948. It's exactly the same thing. Again, there's urgency to help the Ukrainians, 750 billion, 100 billion uh, proposed by the Banque Européenne d'Investissement. You can, you can amount these figures, everyone is doing its job. But I think it's not only about that, it's a mindset. We have to change the mindset. And if we do not do that, there will be future Ukraine crisis. Other Ukraines, maybe in Moldova, maybe elsewhere, and of course in Africa, or uh, taking an example that what Russia is doing today, China may be willing to do it tomorrow, and earlier than we think. If we do not do that, then there will be other crises that will go out of control and in which unity, in which European Union standing together will no longer be the case. So it will be a moment to look back to. Before I turn to Mr. Yuga, let me ask the participants to think of questions they would like to ask our panelists, if there are any. Prepare them before our time is up. Mr. Yuga, global perspective, IMF, do we aim for a global Marshall Plan then? <laughs> uh, first of all, let me agree with what uh, Minister Spataru and Professor DP uh, commented um, a few minutes ago. It's, uh, the reconstruction of Ukraine is not only about the rich countries club. It should be about a broader constituency. And it would be interesting to see, for instance, China contributing to the reconstruction of Ukraine. That would be an interesting one. Having said that, it would be fundamentally important for the Ukrainians to take part in the reconstruction of the country and learn from the mistakes made in other international assistance programs, where, for instance, contracts were awarded to foreign contractors who came, brought the workforce, built, and then left. It would be important to involve Ukrainian businesses in the reconstruction to have to pay wages, to pay social security, to develop expertise and uh, skills in the country, and not to have contractors coming and then going. For the money, if you want for the money, to irrigate the Ukrainian economic soil and to generate businesses in Ukraine. That's my first comment. The second comment is we must use tested methods and approaches which worked in other situations. For instance, a number of instruments and tools have been de developed in the context of COVID. And I will refer, for instance, to the European Guarantee Fund, uh, whereby European Union or the European Commission through the European Investment Bank is providing guarantees for credit enhancement with the objective to bring in the private sector with a very significant leverage. For instance, with 15 billion euros, you can mobilize 100 billion euros in total. Because at the end of the day, if you want, to, to integrate Ukraine into the Western world is not about assistance money for macro stabilization. It's about helping the private business to get their foot or their feet in Ukraine and to create an environment which is connected to the Western economic world, if you want. So learn from the mistakes is important and use tested tools and build uh, expertise in Ukraine as well. I, I would also add developing regional partnerships, economic partnerships. But before I ask any questions I might have, let me turn to the audience. If there are any questions from the audience to the speakers. 
the room uh, was full throughout the day, but maybe <laughs> there is a close reception nearby that might dissuade. Uh, I will ask for a final remarks. We're getting close to the end of this panel. I would ask the panelists to develop a punchline argument. What is the critical ingredient for a successful Marshall Plan? And so what is, in your opinion, the main thing that should be done? And maybe what Romania can add. Yeah, um, I might say that there, there, there are more aspects which needs to be to to be considered. But uh, I would point out two. One is the transparency of the whole process, and the second thing is, let's say, getting as Mr. Yuga was mentioning. I fully agree with him. The the deep involvement of the Ukrainians on reconstructing their own country. So those two ingredients, I think they are, the, let's say, critical for, the, let's say, for a success story. Because we have seen in the past, let's say, sad stories. And we should, we, we cannot, we cannot afford to, to, to do it for the Europe and for the future of, uh, let's say, of the, of the region. Well, you're asking me a punchline. Normally, a punchline is very short. I will <laughs> therefore have a very short punchline. First of all, uh, 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 um, a George Marshall Plan, or a new George Marshall Plan, should be a new European perspective, a new vision of what it is and what, stands, uh, for what it stands for to be part of the European Union, part of a community. And this is shared by countries who are not part of the European Union. In the southern flank, uh, on the southern bank of the Mediterranean uh, Sea, for example, in Africa, or in, um, in the Caucasus, or North, South, South Caucasus. Second of all, um, if we were to have a strong commitment for the international community to rebuild Ukraine, we have to rebuild it differently, and therefore take the opportunity to go digital, to have a very robust private sector or a a nexus between private and public sector. We call it partenariat public privé in French, public private partnership, which is very important because it brings in local authorities and not only states. So take Ukraine as a laboratory to have more local authority taking a, a stand. To have a less centralized but a more decentralized perspective, which is one of the reasons why the war started before 2014 and was not achieved with Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. So have a more uh, reflection of what it stands to be part of a union where you have countries, but you have strong local authorities, which has, are important because they provide social goods, they provide public uh, sec sec uh, security, public services and public security. I'm already too long. So my, 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 in resume or in short term, in a nutshell, go global and go local. Thank you. Uh, a few sentences, maybe very brief ones. Stay on course and avoid the fatigue. Uh, because we are going to see fatigue. We are going to have elections in different countries and both the public and the politicians may get tired of talking about Ukraine. Then, rebuild a better Ukraine, a different Ukraine, as Professor Dupuy said. Technologically advanced. Among the six million Ukrainian refugees, probably a lar uh, you have a large percentage of the IT people. Whom you have to bring them back if possible. Yes. So at the end of the day, build a better Ukraine, and in order to 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 to, to keep the momentum, share the success stories, and that's important, and win the war. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we all hope for peace within a, a long conversation about the war. Uh, if there are not, no, no, no longer questions from the room, I would like to thank everyone for attending, summarizing the key uh, points, transparency and ownership, a strong EU vision that's active at both the global and local level, the 
decentralization of Ukraine, we know, was an EU-led effort of assistance and it was very successful and it provided resilience. We at Aspen Institute have a local resilience index project that uh, will be available online soon for Romania and Moldova not Ukraine, but an interesting project. And last but not least, build a better economy, a new economic model that can be exported to Ukraine as well, while we're trying to build one in Europe as well. Thank you very much for the, the insightful discussion, and thank you all for participating online with us today. I'm sorry to say that just for the people in the audience, there's a reception um, that will take place in the garden at 6 o'clock. Thank you all so much and hope to see you next year at the Atlantic Lexi Forum. <laughs>